Greetings, everyone, <laughs> and welcome to a premature Ejaco Lantern edition <laughs> of Monster Party. Monster Party! It's Party! It's Halloween! It's early! It is! Yes. It's, it's, a, it's really early, but. It should start early because we love Halloween. That's right. Oh, yeah. That's right. And and speaking of early, <laughs> <laughs> I am punctual. <laughs> yes. Who are you, sir? I'm Matt Weinhold. I'm Sean Sheridan. I'm Larry Strove. And I'm James Conus. And for this episode, we wanted to get that Halloween feeling started early. We want right. to get that wheel rolling <laughs> because I think we all agree that Halloween is our favorite holiday. I like oh, Christmas. Christmas sure. is okay. Sure. But Halloween is the shit, right? I oh, mean, oh. It's, it's fantastic. It's yes. the bomb. And it's just getting bigger and bigger every year. In yes. Time. Proof of that would be that as you go into stores now, the Halloween stuff comes out earlier and earlier. Oh, yeah. The season just keeps ex- expanding every yes. year. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I would say, I mean, I, I, I went into Rite Aid and I saw them putting up the Halloween stuff and I figure, okay, this is the perfect time for this episode, which is a way to kind of get you going, get you ready, get you started. Matt, what is, our, what, phenomenon. Is this? what is this topic? The topic is Halloween Essentials. Halloween Essentials! Halloween <laughs> Essentials. We're talking movies, we're talking decorations, we're talking costumes, anything that makes Halloween that special, wonderful holiday that we all enjoy. The spirit of Halloween, the yes. The spirit of yeah. Halloween. And now more than ever, we need to keep that spirit alive. Oh, yes. We we're going through a difficult time. Yes, right, right. Yes. But... We need a guide, a Sherpa, yes. if you will, yes. to help us a maneuver wise our way. Sage, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And we have we have that person. This is this is a guest that we've really wanted to have on for a very long time. I'll say this, this gentleman is an author, a filmmaker, a lecturer. He's one of the genre cinema's top historians. He has spoken and taught at dozens of colleges and universities on the genre. He has done numerous documentaries, featurettes, and commentaries on so many DVDs and Blu-ray sets and collections of all our favorite horror films, including many of the classic Universal monster films. Uh, He is an author who's written so many books, just as an example, just a few. Uh, Some of his books include Hollywood Gothic, The Tangled Web of Dracula from Novel to Stage to Screen, The Monster Show, A Cultural History of Horror, Death Makes a Holiday, A Cultural History of Halloween, V is for Vampire, Dark Carnival, The Secret World of Todd Browning, Vampires, Encounters with the Undead, and many more. And he has a brand new book, (gasps) which is perfect to be discussing on this episode, called Fright Favorites. Fright Favorites! 31 Movies to Haunt Your Halloween and Beyond. And this is a book that spotlights 31 horror films, both modern and classic, that capture the true spirit of Halloween. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David J. Scowl. David J. Scowl! Hey, Hey, thank you. Thank you so much. What a a lead-in. Oh yeah! Um, no, we yeah, take our know, time. <laughs> yes. No, you you've done a lot, sir. Yes, you've done yeah. a lot. Yes, you have. Yeah, no, you've imprinted your work on all of us. I mean, every time we go to any of those DVDs, and that's the thing. It's it's so wonderful having you here because I feel like it's like we already know you. It's like we. Yes. You're our friend. You led us through the background of all these wonderful movies that we yeah. grew up with and, kind of, and still kind of love like, to this day. Kind of like the old horror hosts of the day would be like our gateway. Yeah, right? yeah. They became right. friends to us at Late Night TV, and David has done that for us through commentaries and books and so forth. Well, I so felt welcome. a little bit. Yeah, thank you. I felt a little bit like a horror host when I started doing those intros for the Universal films. And sure, it was, sure. It was a very, very unexpected thing. It... it uh, I had done a documentary independently on the making of the movie Gods and Monsters that uh, oh, yes. oh, okay. yeah. Bill Condon's right. Academy Award winning film. And it was kind of a labor of love for everybody. And mm-hmm. it was difficult to uh, get any money for it. It was difficult to get it produced. Everything was a volunteer 
effort, but it it clicked and it really it it still holds up. I'm I'm very proud of it. And it turned out that Universal was going to distribute the first uh, DVD. Mm-hmm. And right. so I took them over, you know, a, a master copy of the the documentary and uh, we chatted and it was one of the strangest meetings I'd ever had because they said, well, would you be interested in doing a, uh, we're, we're going to release the mummy. Would you be interested in doing something for that? And I said, you're doing DVDs on all the, I said, I said I'd love to do them all for you. And, <laughs> and then I got thrown the question. Well, if we gave you a half million dollars, how much could you do? <laughs> wow. wow. And could you, could you do a half dozen for us? And, um, and uh, I said, yeah, I think so. And uh, <laughs> how about Frankenstein? If we gave you that assignment now, could you deliver, you know, a finished documentary and all kinds of extras and a commentary track and that uh, one month from today? Oh, my God. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> oh. And so- I said, sure, I'll do it. <laughs> and uh, it, was, uh, it was it was very intimidating because I hadn't done all that many of these uh, kind of documentary projects. But I, I figured it out, and I ended up bringing the whole thing in um, way under their budget, which they, they weren't pleased about. I really? thought you'd get a pat on the back. No, you're yeah. supposed to spend all the money because, really? you know, because the next time their, their division won't, uh, will get a smaller amount of money for whatever they do. Uh, she should have just came in and the next day in a real fancy suit, you know, like, <laughs> we're, we're on budget. <laughs> right. I mean, I know Universal sometimes has a reputation of, you know, not taking the best care or thought to their classic legacy of films. I mean, were they, if you hadn't come by their way, would they have not done anything, you think, or, or squandered that opportunity to have these nice documentaries on these classic films? I'm, I'm not sure. They hadn't approached anyone else, and right. I, uh, I was in the right place at the right time. I, right, I, right. It fell together so quickly. The only way I was able to make it work was to, to use a lot of the, the same talking heads over and over, and right, I couldn't right. use everybody I wanted because what I had to do was, okay, we're going to go to New York, and we're going to uh, set up in a hotel conference room on this date and this date, and... Uh, who can we get to be there? And that's <laughs> right. the window. And then we'll do another one out here in LA and wow. maybe some individual fly rounds. But it was, uh, I, I found out that when people do these kinds of documentaries, they, they rarely do more than uh, uh, one or two interviews in a, in a day. Right. I did six <laughs> at, a, wow. at a clip wow. right. and, right. Uh, you know, worked very uh, carefully with the crew and we had all kinds of different backdrops and, uh, and, and lighting effects, so we could uh, we could have some variety in there. And mm-hmm. um, it seems very I, I really warm. Learned, I, yeah. I really learned on the job. But the thing that was interesting about it is that I realized I had been producing documentaries all along with my books. I had grown up watching documentaries, watching, listening to Talking Heads, paired up with film clips and and narration and all that sort of thing. And it was just kind of burned into me. Right. I fell into it instantly. And I, uh, I loved it. It also takes a lot less time to write one of these scripts than it does to <laughs> research and write a book. Sure, uh, sure. They're really, yeah. they're very, they're very different, different uh, disciplines. Yeah. Uh, you, but there's there a consistency. Something... There's a consistency, I think, to all your documentaries. I mean, you know, yes, you have some of the same authorities talking about them, but that, I don't mind that. And they love the material. They yes, love the source right. material, yeah. too. It's nothing yeah, it's not you know, dry. S- or snarky at all about it, you know, yeah. which is no, great. No, no, no. Every, everyone was uh, on board with it. I didn't get a single uh, you know, moment of hesitation from anybody right. I approached. Uh, some people just could not be in the geographical area, and that was, that was, that was a shame. But uh, if there's a consistency to them, it's because I worked very intently with a really terrific uh, hand-picked crew. I, I worked with the same, uh, the same cameraman, uh, cameraman and, and crews, the same editor, brilliant guy named uh, Keith Clark, who's uh, done a lot of work for David Fincher since, and oh, has wow. uh, gone on to a lot of great things, and um, wonderful makeup artist. Your makeup artist is one of the best secret weapons you've got for putting, <laughs> I'll putting say. people. No, for putting people <laughs> at, at at ease. And yeah, uh, sure. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And if an older actress comes who has really overdone her own makeup, <laughs> can be very diplomatic about it right. and tone everything down without uh, ruffling any feathers. 
So they're delivered unto you in the director chair across from yours, and uh, and that's it. But uh, it it was a uh, it was a twenty four seven kind of proposition for two years while I was uh, working on those things. But I loved it. I cool. I've consulted on a number of documentaries. I'd still like to do a few more of my own. But it's not often that a big entertainment conglomerate has a uh, very big pot of money. In this sure. case, yeah. they, they were starting yeah. their, their Halloween Horror Nights, and they had wow. like a, a $20 million pot of cash for something they called Universal Is Halloween. And it was supposed to be a multi-level huh. projection of their, their brand onto every aspect of the holiday. And these documentaries, you know, for a couple of seasons were that. And then they went on to something else. And uh, nobody was interested in the same way. And they were also, those those documentaries were used to bring people into the DVD format Mm -hmm. and to offer, you know, a a value added that they didn't have on the the VHSs because everybody had all the VHS tapes, all the classics. Mm -hmm. They'd all been done and there had to be a reason to... uh, get the DVDs. Now, the picture right. quality would, I, for me, it would have been plenty. But right, uh, right. we served that function, just dragging people into the, the new digital format. That's and cool. and well, now I, it's not being done. These things aren't being done uh, as much. And those yeah. are extras that I still go back to. And, yeah, they're kind of, yeah, oh, some ways yeah. are the yeah. f- definitive on those films, you know. Yeah, it was, it was fun that I was, uh, most of the time I had to talk to film historians and and the children of famous actors. But uh, for a couple of them, I did get to talk to the real article, the, the uh, Back to the Black Lagoon, oh, where I right. had the chance oh, yeah. to, that, I had both Julie Adams oh, and Rico Browning and Ben Chapman. Yeah. They were that's, all terrific people. And that's one of my favorites. Yeah. It was like getting into a time machine. Yeah, sure. Back there. And sure. Uh, <laughs> now only uh, Rico is still with us now uh, and still yeah. making appearances uh, up to... Uh, beginning of the lockdown uh he was right. uh, appearing at conventions just last year i uh, introduced him at a 60th anniversary celebration they called it a gillibration <laughs> uh, <laughs> from the black lagoon down at uh, silver springs florida That's one cool. of the springs yeah, where they right. actually filmed it yeah and you could see i i took one of those glass bottom boat rides and i have never seen water this clear in my life it's obvious mm-hmm. why they they wanted to shoot in a location sure, like that sure. instead of on they the They should do, do they ever do a thing where they have like somebody in the costume with a tank, <laughs> you know, <laughs> swim under the glass bottom boat. That'd be so great. Like that would that would make they my did, day. They didn't do that, but I did I went to a Monsterama convention in Atlanta a few years ago where they had a fantastic I don't know who it was, but they had a fantastic creature swimming around in the hotel pool. Oh nice. Wow. Pictures. That's and, cool. That's uh, great. It was fun. <laughs> Poke him with a cattle prod. <laughs> so let, let me just let me just ask because I'm a huge creature fan. Um, David, when when you were on the glass bottom boat and you're going over the lagoon, did you recognize any parts of the lagoon? Go, oh, oh, that's probably part where. where <laughs> because it's always been my dream I, to I go there. I recognize that rock. Yeah. yeah see, cool. See, here's the funny. That's thing. the famous coral. No, 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 no. See, these it, guys kind of joke about it, but the honest thing is, is, when you look at the film, you know, it's it's very clear about the rocks and the, the, the vines and stuff. And, and I've always wanted to go there and just learn how to scuba dive so I can go in the same area <laughs> where the creature swam. Nobody was swimming there at all. They're limestone springs. And I was just so startled that you could, you could see like a hundred feet and it was crystal clear. Mm-hmm. It, it, it was really tremendous. The, uh, and then it's also fun when you, get to do these things and have, uh, you know, one of the actual performers there to uh, sure. regale you with yeah. stories. Oh, Rico's, right. uh, he's up, he doesn't swim anymore, but right. uh, it was, if he had was, to, I'm, I'm assuming. <laughs> <laughs> it was my, uh, it was, it was my association with these people that finally made me uh, finally learn how to swim. At, oh, wow. Uh, oh, wow. Other people are retiring and I still do it every day now. And, That's awesome. Uh, Wait a minute, David, and, do, when you were a kid though, didn't you, after you saw the creatures as a kid, didn't you, you didn't want to get in a pool and kind of swim like the creature. I mean, I was obsessed with that. I always tried to swim like the creature, not, you know, how you're supposed to. I would always do this. Didn't you do I that? Probably. Yeah. I don't remember. I remember getting a really bad sunburn in a backyard <laughs> pool. I mean, I, I mean, serious third degree burn. Boy, wow. yeah, that'll do it. 
uh, yeah. when I was probably about 12 years old, and it kept me out of that. May, that may have turned me off uh, uh, learning how to swim properly. <laughs> I, I, I'm with you. My life. Where did you get it? Was it the because I, I remember getting it in Hawaii on the back of my thighs. Ooh. And this that was on my back, and I was out in the backyard in it in one of those uh, above ground pools that were okay. all the rage in the 50s and 60s. Sure. And, uh, yeah. and it was a cloudy day. And so I was just out Ah, there yeah. That'll, that'll trick you. Yeah. And so I looked, uh, you know, like Vincent Price on House of Wax. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 I could identify with all these burn victims. Uh, wow. <laughs> but, yeah. But yeah. I've been just very privileged to, uh, I didn't get everybody into these documentaries that I met because it, I'd been doing books for a while before mm-hmm. Universal tapped me. But when I started doing these books with Hollywood Gothic, these movies and the stage plays they were based on were kind of at the absolute limits of living human memory. And you were uh, meeting people in their 90s. Mm-hmm. And I yeah, met uh, right. quite, quite a few. David Manners, for instance, was just, I would have wow. loved to. Have, I don't think he would have sat down for an on-camera interview. He was approached by so many people, almost harassed by people who just, huh. uh, he finally, he snapped at somebody once who was going on and on. And he said, you're not interested in me at all. I'm just a surrogate for Bela Lugosi, as far as you're concerned. <laughs> oh, wow. And, they, and there was a great, that, it was absolutely true. So he, I'm not, he always told me that he had always refused to watch Dracula because huh. he really didn't enjoy making it and didn't enjoy Hollywood. He was, he was trained really? on the new, uh, he was a Broadway trained actor and it's a very different uh, kind of thing. The actor is really in control of the moment on stage. And right. in Hollywood, he explained to me, he said, he said it was crazy. They shot out of sequence and they put these, <laughs> chalk, these chalk marks on the floor for you. And, right. But he thought uh, Lugosi was just really full of himself. And, well, David, yeah. I know that uh, you, you were also instrumental in bringing to light or involved with you know, making people more aware of the Spanish version of Dracula, right? I mean, you had a lot to do with that. Uh, yeah, I kind of, I heard about it and there was a protection copy of the original negative that was at the Library of Congress. Uh, It was a safety print made from a nitrate negative. And I went down there and you could just call it up and they'd put it on a moviola for you and you could uh, go through. And it was just a time consuming process. And uh, there was a missing reel. And it was that reel where the the transition from Transylvania to to London and and the boat and the uh, uh, the first encounter in the concert hall. And without that, Universal didn't have any reason to even dream of bringing it back. Right. So I started poking around and asking about it and found myself telexing back there. They're uh, a, a primitive uh, communications tool compared to anything we have today uh, with the Cinemateca de Cuba in Havana. And the director told me, oh, yes, we have a very nice complete print of the Spanish yeah. Dracula. In fact, we just showed it in our uh, <laughs> wow. theater a few no. weeks ago. Wow. And you're, we're happy to have you be our guest anytime you want. So that was uh, encouraging. Uh, it was still a little difficult because the uh, Treasury Department uh, at that time really prevented most Americans from going there at all. You could oh, get wow. a an educational visa or a journalistic visa mm-hmm. and go down for um, a very short visit. You could go down for three days or five days, I think, you know, was the option. So my publisher, W.W. W. Norton, uh, vouched for me and we made, there was one travel agent that could book these, <laughs> these flights. They were chartered flights. Uh, Actually, the Continental Airlines had chartered middle-of-the-night flights from Miami to Havana. <laughs> and wow. you went down there, and at some point, the Dade County Sheriff showed up and corralled all of the passengers into a, you know, a roped-off area. And they never told you exactly when the plane was going to leave. It would happen sometime in the middle of the night. Weird. Wow. And... Uh, it's like it's like the equipment. It was, like the airline. A, it was like a it was a twenty minute flight, you know, to uh, to Havana. It's like the airline equivalent of like taking the horse and buggy up to the Castle Dracula. Yeah. You know, it's like it's also <laughs> kind of a spy movie too. You know, yeah, but, yeah. yeah. that's crazy. So, so anyway, I got there and they 
showed me the missing reel from the Spanish Dracula, and they put it on this really ancient. I thought the Moviola at the Library of Congress was something. This was <laughs> was a manual thing, and uh, let me examine it with a magnifying glass and. And they were just kind of spooling it out all over the floor. And I said, oh please God. don't do this. Is there, any way you can sh- is there any way you can show this to me on a screen? And I could take pictures maybe of the uh, projected image. I've got my camera and everything. Mm-hmm. So that's what we did. And I got those frame enlargements that uh, I used in, in Hollywood Gothic. And uh, that's awesome. uh, the book got a lot of attention and word got back. And I made a very strong case that this ought to be all you know, reassembled somehow. Yeah, And Universal managed to do it. They could not engage with a commercial project directly with the, uh, uh, the Cinemateca, but through a uh, kind of a daisy chain of film archives around the world, they were able to uh, get it to Los Angeles and make a copy of it and send it back. And so everybody was very excited about this. And at the last minute, some, some executive at Universal wanted to call it off because that third reel was of such uh, you know a degraded quality compared to the rest of the film he they said people would want their money back mm. and that was not the case at all and uh, it was actually the family of uh, lupita tovar uh, the star of the film uh, had many close they had they had some muscle as far as ah. universal and and Saner heads prevailed, let's put it that way. Cool. And it went on, and that that release of the film in, that was 92. It was exactly the same week uh, that the Coppola Dracula opened. I remember that because we had a screening of the Spanish film at the uh, Director's Guild Theater. And I was there with with Lupita and we introduced it. And that uh, VHS tape made more money than the big budget release of Spartacus that Universal had done the same. Is that right? No. Wow. And they suddenly, and they realized just what, that the, you know, the Spanish speaking audience was very big as it sure. was in 1931, which uh, is the reason Universal made this, uh, this, this unusual right. film. Right. Right. I did not realize that movie studios did this where they would shoot a film and then shoot a Spanish language version at night. Yeah, they did, and they did some in French and in German, but most of them were in Spanish because there were more Spanish-speaking countries uh, right. around the world. And the novelty and excitement of talking pictures was hearing actors speak in their natural mm-hmm. voices. Yeah, sure. The sure. idea of the idea of dubbing was thought of as you know, well, this is cheating. This is this is fake. Right. And so for a few years, this this was done. And uh, I, re- and it was also they're they're just wonderful behind the scenes intrigue and rivalries and personalities at the studio the the producer of the film paul Koner, produced it because he assumed he was going to get to produce the english language version of uh, dracula which would have starred conrad veit and something didn't happen and Koner expected to take over the studio himself he was uh, carl lemley senior's protege and uh, was as shocked as everybody else when Lemley gave it over to his uh, 21-year-old son as a birthday present. Uh, and Julius Lemley became uh, Carl Lemley Jr. And Koner was kind of shoved off to the side to supervise foreign releases and markets and distribution. But uh, with Dracula, he got the chance to not only upstage the Todd Browning film, but sure. to uh, Lupita Tovar, who he had fallen in love with. She had done a few previous films there thought that uh, talkies were the end of her Hollywood career and she was ready to go back to Mexico. So he, Dracula kept her in Los Angeles for a little bit longer and he right. did, uh, finally uh, popped the question and they did tie the knot. So there was this wonderful love story in there and all this uh, <laughs> uh, crazy uh, intrigue. I mean, Dracula was interesting to write about because so many people, who crossed the path of that property, that book, that play, or the movie, they become obsessed with it. They want to control it. They want to make money from it. The agent for the Stoker and Dean and Balderston uh, states, which still collect money from the uh, stage play, Mm -hmm. it's still in copyright for a few more years. He told me that uh, he dreaded negotiating a new production of Dracula anywhere because it brought out the worst instincts and everybody involved. 
<laughs> and the greed and the um, they brought out the control freak. People right. wanted to possess and control and dominate. And, right, it's such and, a hot uh, property. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dracula yeah. himself you know, got yeah. uh, got the upper hand with these things, and wow. uh, usually had the last laugh because a lot of people really just crashed upon the shores of Dracula. You know, Lugosi fought very hard for the role. He was the very last person the studio considered. That's and amazing. So he became, strange his career in in that respect that. You know, well, he became so he became so identified with the part yeah. that he could do nothing else. I mean, it really yeah. scuttled his career because yeah. he didn't wear a special makeup. Really, it was his face, it was his voice, and uh, any time uh, you know the public would see him again or consider him for a part, they would see and hear Dracula. Yeah, and other That's people, uh, Frank Langella had the, he thought he thought his whole you know screen career was uh, was really hobbled for a while. He said, I forgot about doing Dracula 10 minutes after we finished it, but it took Hollywood 10 years before they would let him, you know, uh, do anything else. Right. So I wonder if the, just the embrace now that we have just in general as a culture of genre stuff now, it's, it's way more popular, I think, certainly than it was when we were growing up. And that it now allows a lot of actors to, yeah, you can be Dracula, you can go on and be something else. You can do that. And it's interesting to see how Lugosi did have a certain amount of range, especially when you watch something like uh, Son of Frankenstein, you see him do Igor, which is such an incredible performance. And I would think that you'd watch that and go, oh, hey, there's more to this guy than Dracula. But he he had such a hard road. Yeah. And that part uh, almost uh, didn't exist. It was almost yeah. improvised. I heard it that they added scenes that, like the, somebody, the director, or somebody wanted to add more of him because there wasn't. It was never. Of him. There was never a final shooting script, and they just kept, you know, doing pages every day. And uh, Lugosi gave, to my mind, you know, the performance of his career. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. great. It's so good. And um, in in Dracula, he may be just too. I, I talked to Raymond Huntley. The actor who played it on stage in England first and turned down the chance to do it on Broadway. And he, he really? was a very young man. He was only 20 years old. He was one of these character actors who could project much older. And so we were able to, I was only in my, uh, I was in my mid forties, I think at the time, and he was in his mid eighties, but we were able to sit in the same room and talk about it. Wow. And I asked him, I said, did you uh, meet Lugosi? And he said, no. And I said, well, what, what about the film? He said, well, I didn't see him on stage, but I saw him in, in the film, of course. And I said, Anne, what did you think? And he just rolled his eyes and said, well, was it really a bit over the top? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I don't> <laughs> and uh, he was very surprised that apparently Paramount had been considering him for uh, the part in a uh, production they might do. And I, so he was very interested in talking to me because I had dug up all of this, <laughs> the, these documents, these negotiation documents and correspondences that nobody had seen in uh, over 60 years. Wow. It, it was, uh, again, one of those time, ca- uh, not time capsule, but time machine moments. Yeah. He, he thought that Dracula, he did it mo- actually more than any stage actor. He really did it 4,000 times on the stage. He toured wow. the English provinces for years. He toured America for several years. And uh, Lugosi did it several hundred times you know, on stage and, uh, and a brief tour in the late 20s. And, but uh, even Huntley said, uh, you know, he thought he uh, inhibited his, his chances. And he kept reminding me that uh, he and John Gilgood were exactly the same age and <laughs> had had some of the same training and went to the same school together. <laughs> and uh, he said, I could have been doing more serious things and maybe moved on further with my uh, career. But here he was at 86 and he was still appearing in West End shows and Wow, that's uh, incredible! Beloved, beloved character actor, one of the uh, most amazing people I met. When it comes to the Spanish language Dracula, I'm just curious because if I was to put together a list of some of my Halloween favorites, I would put that version on that list because I would. I know that everyone is so familiar with the Lugosi version. I'd want them to see this because it is so different in a lot of ways. Just the cinematography and the acting. And I'm just curious, was there a competition between the two productions? Did George Melford go, oh, okay, all right, I'm going to make the definitive Dracula? 
I think it, it was it was Paul Conner rather than uh, George Melford who was the director. Oh, but, is that right? Uh, he, yes, he was the driving force behind. Is that this. right? And um, he had a rivalry going, and he resented the fact that Junior Lemley was running the studio and uh, and and not him. And it was a point of you know pride. And they had the chance to look at the rushes every day from what Todd Browning was doing, and and from what I can determine. Todd Browning was not a happy camper there at all. Universal brought him over with uh, not the understanding, the expectation that he would be directing Lon Chaney Sr. as uh, Dracula. Ah. And uh, it was a big secret in Hollywood at the time that uh, Chaney uh, was dying of cancer, you know, the summer that all the Dracula negotiations were being finished. But rather than see it go to MGM, Lemley uh, bought the rights and uh, these two different productions were done. And the thing that's fascinating about the Spanish film is it was done on the same sets uh, at night. They hung different lights, which is why in many, many scenes, you can see the compositions are, are flipped left to right because they're not disturbing the, uh, you know, the camera rigging, uh, the lighting. Okay. Uh, mm, wow. Instruments that have been, you know, lit for one. Right. And they move much faster than the uh, yes. American film, yeah. to the point where there are scenes where there are no cobwebs and uh, <laughs> Carfax <laughs> Abbey, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, but there, there was a the fact that the negative, except for that negative reel that had turned to nitrate gunk, it hadn't been touched since 1931. It was pristine. Wow. And un- unlike the the camera negative for the. Lugosi Browning film fell to pieces, you know, long ago, mm-hmm. and uh, all the prints we see today are are from a uh, what they called a um, a lavender protection print that uh, was very fine grain, but was not the same thing as the. Uh, well, I, I think they've done a fantastic job on the Blu-ray with the digital restoration. Yes, yeah. yeah. it looks yeah. as good as yeah. it's ever, ever, ever going to look. Yeah, but the overall feeling of the film is. Uh, it's it's more atmospherically lit. Uh, yes, there's mm-hmm. this, a great deal more camera movement. It's less stagey. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Carl Carl Freund had the idea that he wanted the camera to be very mobile in Dracula, and he got away with it in the uh, opening scenes. But the as the budgetary pressures on the film increased, it crawled down, and the latter half of the film is essentially a film stage play. Yeah, yeah, but. George Melford and Robinson, his uh, cinematographer, really milked every bit of uh, shadow and fog and and atmosphere out of it that they 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 could, and it looks like something that was shot in the forties rather than the uh, yeah. It looks big. Mm-hmm. It looks like a and big the, production. The sets are almost a character in and of themselves. Like it's yeah. And they had the chance to, in, and they could second guess the American film. There are a lot of things that. Should have been in there. There's a wonderful glass shot of uh, Carfax Abbey that only appears in the Spanish film and other sets that you just don't see. Right. And it does have its, um, I mean, the actor who plays Dracula, Carlos Villarías, was a stage actor uh, born in Spain, but also uh, worked in Argentina for a long period. I think he was basically permanently a resident in, in Argentina before he came up to do films in Mexico and and the States, he was the only actor who was allowed to look at the performances of Lugosi every day. They wanted him to be as Lugosi-like as possible. And it's debatable whether he is uh, or not. It's, it's a somewhat laughable performance, but I think he gives, it, he gives it a shot. The character of Dracula was not, it was not a cliché at that, that moment. Right. Lugosi wasn't a cliché. Nobody had seen this sort of thing right. in the uh, American cinema before i mean this was a, a a real story about a real vampire and in the silent days there were terrifying characters usually played by lon cheney but there weren't any supernatural monsters and it was one of the reasons uh, universal and all the other studios were hesitant to take on dracula except that it had done really really well on the stage and it turned out it did really well for uh, 1931 audiences sure uh, it was such a novelty. It was so weird that uh, uh, people flocked to it. And it was also, it was the worst year of the Great Depression. And I think, uh, you know, the 
Dracula himself was kind of an embodiment of, uh, you know, a mysterious draining force at everyone's door. And I don't think that's actually reading too much into it. I think, uh, you know, things like depressions and wars and, and epidemics, uh, you know, always end up setting in motion distinct patterns in, in horror entertainment. Sure. Um, now, David, I'm, I'm going to guess that since the Universal monsters, starting with Dracula, really took off, that maybe that's why Universal didn't do any more Spanish language versions of the monster movies, because they knew that they were going to make money no matter where they played. Is that, is that right? Well, the technology of uh, dubbing really, uh, which was pretty primitive uh, in 19, 1931, I mean, it, it, it could be done. But uh, Dracula, in fact, was released in a dubbed ver- uh, Lugosi version in uh, Puerto Rico for some reason. So the technology caught up and it was just too much of a, uh, a hassle, the idea of doing simultaneous uh, full productions of talking pictures. And uh, it was so easy in the, uh, you know, there was a big foreign market for silent films because all you had to do was have a different set of titles in every district and right. every region. And so I don't know why, there, uh, why they didn't think of uh, Frankenstein, but I think Dracula was really kind of the, really the end of it the uh it was the most maybe the most ambitiously realized of these these things but it was a, it was a short window you know the hollywood went from uh, all silent to you right, know, all right. talking in just you know it was about three and a half years well um david as far as like you know being this is a halloween themed episode i want to ask you too like growing up i mean you're a horror film authority you're a mon- fellow monster kid what was Halloween like and what the Halloween season like for you growing up, you know, as you were, became more and more fascinated by this genre? Well, I always liked it. It was very exciting, and it was exciting for me to uh, – it was more exciting anticipating it than getting involved because I would always procrastinate <laughs> on the costumes. And yeah. I, would do the, I would do the easiest thing, which was a vampire. I did that uh, many, sure. many years. All you had to do, you had to have some, some, some white makeup and some Vaseline in your hair and a black piece of cloth and a white shirt. And, <laughs> and I, so I cheated. I really uh, didn't. Uh, I, I made up for, for it later when I started making my own eight millimeter uh, monster movies. Ah, and sure. I, yeah, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but are you did saying- get into costumes and makeup and I, I, I played the, uh, the wolf man myself. Ah, nice. Yeah. Your own makeup? I did. I used uh, <laughs> brown twine that I shredded to make. <laughs> nice. Well, that's, that's pretty and yeah. I creative. Them, I, I, I cut out little pieces of flesh-colored Band-Aids and glued the hair onto it. So then it could just be you know, put on. <laughs> wow. my face. Pretty ingenious. <laughs> we did a, I had been very impressed by the movie Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. And so oh. we kind of recreated that scene where the... Uh, Larry Talbot comes back to life in, in the crypt. Uh, his coffin was an old, a fairly large cedar chest I had in my house <laughs> that uh, my mother never expected that to uh, be put to that use. But, uh, <laughs> but I did have fun with all, doing all kinds of special effects and makeups on, uh, mostly experimenting on the neighbor kids, but not, not for Halloween. Halloween was about uh, you know, collecting candy much more than the costumes. And Do you have a favorite I, candy? Candy corn. Oh, oh that right. Really? Yeah. I could so, never get enough of it. Wow. I like it around the Halloween season. I don't know if I can. And of course, that's the only time it's available, but I don't think I could eat it. Some, like, somehow, I've kept, somehow I've kept my teeth. I know a lot of people <laughs> just ate it. <laughs> they think right. it's awful fun, right. I, uh, yeah. I associate the taste and the, the, you know, the look of it with Halloween. So I, I, I take it that you made a lot of your costumes. You never had your mom and dad buy you a costume, like a Ben Cooper uh, costume or a rubber mask. It was always you made it yourself. Is that the case? Yeah, come to think of it. No, I, I never had a store-bought hmm, wow. mask. They were there. I was aware of them. And uh, Universal was just starting to come out with those, uh, the Don Post masks. And, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Who could afford those? those? No, but nobody could afford those. Yeah, yeah so, totally. You know, it's I could, great. It's, I could afford back issues of Famous Monsters. Right. From right. Famous <laughs> Monsters. I, I was like, but none I, of the merchandise. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like, I was like, I can almost afford the hands. <laughs> yeah. I did. Yeah. Oh, I did have a uh, hideous rubber hand that uh, I think it was like, like one of the Morlocks from 
the time machine or something like huh. that, but it was just really a, a, a hideous disfigured rubber hand. And that, that was a store-bought item okay. that I used on some, some Halloween or another. You still have it? No. Long decayed, I'm sure. <laughs> I do have a ma- I did. A, I made a Frankenstein mask out of paper mache that wow. I do have. It wasn't for Halloween. I, I thought I wanted to make it just, thought I would make a movie or something that I never did. It is still up in uh, my office closet here. Wow. Um, <laughs> you got to put that thing under I, glass or something. That's... <laughs> well, I've got some pictures of it. I, uh, when I went back to clean out the old family house in Ohio, I uh, posed for some pictures wearing it on the front porch. <laughs> nice. I need to put those on uh, Facebook, I think. Uh, yes, you do. You do. Very yes, much so. you do. Yes. Yeah. You know, like, make like, us very happy. Like you as a kid, I, I also wanted to be Frankenstein, but this was the one year I was fortunate enough that my mom said, all right, you want to be Frankenstein and got me a Ben Cooper costume. But the problem with it was, you know, like many of these costumes that came later, as, as you know, you got a really cool mask. But the little costume that you would wear, it would actually have a picture right. of the character, and it would say Frankenstein on it. And I, yeah. and I didn't want to do that. I, I wanted to look like Frankenstein. So, exactly. you know, I and and so yeah, you I, didn't want to look like a Frankenstein fan. No, no. <laughs> but like, like James is brought up on another show, and I think it's totally brilliant. It was like as if you went up to someone's door. If they didn't know what you were, they could look at your costume and go, oh, so you're oh, Frankenstein because right. it says so. But for me, I wanted to be a real Frankenstein. So I got one of my older brother's jackets that was a little large. And, and sure. my mom thought it was really important that I had to have like Frankenstein hair. So believe it or not, she got me this black furry wig and so wow. i had this this horrible moment when i've gone around the block and and i feel the top of my head and i oh my god my, my wig is gone and and i look on the ground you know it's all dark it's like oh i lost i lost the wig i lost the wig i walked up the street down the street and i was freaking out i thought my mom would get upset and i realized that the elastic had pulled the wig back and it was stuck to my back. So I'm looking around and the darn wig is stuck on my back. I feel like such an idiot after that. But, but and, I, and now poetic justice, you have a very hairy back. Well, <laughs> well, be that as it may, I do have that Frankenstein mask and I still have the wow. Wow. It's impressive. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, you know what I want to do is I would like to get one of the, I would get like to get the artwork from one of those costumes, say Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. And then I want to have that painted on the side of a van. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that would be cool. Uh, David, sure do you, somebody uh, has done that somewhere. I'm sure. Probably, I'm sure. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Do you remember, David, the the movie that made you a monster kid? Your very first monster movie that got you hooked. Well, it was. Um, I must have been six years old, and it was Frankenstein meets the Wolfman okay. as part of the original shock theater package, mm-hmm. and they would show it several times a week. And uh, I remember it was a Saturday matinee television screening on uh, WJW TV in Cleveland, Ohio. And I still remember vividly that scene toward the end where Lugosi as the monster comes to life and smiles on the operating table. And I was uh, absolutely fascinated with monsters from that point on. It wasn't until I was uh, 10 years old that I got my first copy of Famous Monsters of Filmland. My uh, parents really resisted this idea (laughs) for a long time. And uh, I finally wore them down. And then it was really just a part of my life for the next several years. Uh, Do you you have all the Famous Monsters? Do you have issue one? Or do I have some some of the my original set, and I've actually had to replace a lot of it. I rebuilt it, yeah. and with vintage, well thumbed copies that I've gotten, I, I I want them to feel like the real thing. It's quite a trip down memory lane. I, I don't do it a lot, but you can really lose track of time. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Pulling out uh, four or five copies and just mm-hmm. letting yourself go. Just the smell of that paper will just take you away. <laughs> Yeah. But it was, you know, the thing about those magazines was that back in the, you know, the 50s and 60s, there there was no video on demand. No. Right. Sure. You you couldn't see these movies anytime you wanted. And so the the magazines were a kind of a surrogate for yeah. the, the films itself. Oh, yeah. It was a yeah. way to it was a way to relive them and to We've, we've talked about many times in the show how 
if you were a real horror fan, sci-fi fan back in the day, when we were kids, you had to work for your horror and sci-fi. Oh yeah. You had to, you had to, you know, you had to find those magazines wherever you could, those tantalizing photos that, you know, movies you've never seen before. You had to stay up late to catch that late night film because you don't know when it's going to be shown again. I mean, Pay for stuff. the TV guy. You got to pay yeah, for that TV guy. Was, and look you know, for anything. Yeah. It was, and then I, I think one of the reasons I got so fascinated with Dracula was that Cleveland Television stopped showing these films for a period of about eight years. I think from 1960 wow. to 1968. You know, it was the uh, American International films and and right. the Roger Corman films and the the cheap Roger Corman films and all kinds of stuff, but not uh, Dracula, Frankenstein, or, right. or the Wolfman. And so I got it into my head, I think, by way of Forrest J. Ackerman, that Dracula must be the greatest film ever made. And <laughs> and the harder it was to see it, I remember it was showing in Erie, Pennsylvania, on a television, a, little, a small television station there. And I, I found it in TV Guide, and I thought, well, I will create some kind of aerial that I can. <laughs> yeah. and That's I, ambitious. I made something. I don't, it, it was made out of uh, a TV aerial and coat hangers and all kinds of crap. And it didn't work. Ah. I didn't get to see Dracula. Oh, they're brooding. I remember one night because I realized in Pennsylvania, people were watching this movie that I could not see. <laughs> I, I probably, I probably was because I, I grew up in Pennsylvania. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. I've had those situations too, where I looked through the TV guide and there were the channels that you knew you got that came in clear. And then there are the ones that were a little far away and there'd be that movie that they'd be playing. It was always the other channel, the one that was far away that was playing the movie you've never seen. Yeah. And I would just tune in anyway and just through just layers of snow, just <laughs> watching, you know, some, you know, the island of lost souls as if it was happening in the Arctic, you know. Like, <laughs> right. right. Well, I finally got to see Dracula and Frankenstein projected in 35 millimeter at a revival house. In 1968, nice. uh, Universal did start. They released those and a bunch of the W.C. Fields films. The, the first wave of uh, you know nostalgia was ticking in among uh, uh, film fans. And I remember I was, I was disappointed with Dracula. I mean, it was like, is this all there is? And I kept going. But you could go, you could sit in a theater all day long with you know one admission price in those mm. days. Uh, They'll ferret you out if you try to do that as Cineplex today. But sure. uh, I went back to see it again and again and again, you know, hoping to see one of the munchkins who hung himself from a tree, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, in a sense. Uh, so when I finally did discover the Spanish version of Dracula, it was like discovering all these brand new rooms in a familiar old yeah. house. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And That's I, cool. And yeah, also when it, I mean, when it comes to Halloween, that was also time for me because I knew local stations would be showing, you know, having horror movie marathons and stuff like that. That's another reason why I always ate up the Halloween season. You know, you knew that there was going to be more horror there on the TV, you know, around that time. You know, this is 2020 now. How would you say the Halloween season has changed and evolved from when we were kids? You know, because it's become like a pretty big all month uh, events now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's, it starts really with uh, the day after Labor Day. I mean, that's what happened with my book. Its official pub date was, uh, you know, September 1st. Mm -hmm. And uh, the promo uh, will just keep rolling out. Things like this we're doing for a full uh, two months. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Well, yeah. Let, do you, do you know, let's, no... let's, let's take a moment to talk about this. Fright Favorites, 31 Movies to Haunt Your Halloween and Beyond. And David, you do this along with Turner Classic Movies. And what I love about Turner Classic Movies is as we get into that Halloween season, they threw out all of these monster films for like over a month. And yeah. it's so fun. And they're what going to. And, they, and they're, they're, they're a different selection than the ones I chose for the book. We were spotlighting one film every day for 31 days, mm -hmm. plus a runner-up. Uh, if you enjoyed this, you might mm -hmm. like that. So there are really yeah. 62 films. And then... Uh, we probably end up talking about 90 films altogether. Mm -hmm. Wow. We talk about the sequels and the... Uh, but I like how you do it by, by year, too. Like from, yeah. from 1922, from Nosferatu, all the way to Get Out, you know? And it's like, but it's by year. And even though they're 
they're very different films from all different eras. What would you say? I mean, there obviously is one common element about it as far as being in the spirit of Halloween of the season, correct? Yeah, Hollywood itself didn't uh, do Halloween tie-ins until, uh, you know, the 1960s. All these classic films existed in a, uh, you know, kind of a marketing wasteland in a, mm-hmm. in, in a sense. Uh, you know, word of mouth sold them, uh, advertisements in newspapers sold them. But Halloween didn't come into the picture in a big way until the, the 60s and the 70s. And ever since, it has just uh, been an exponential growth uh, until it's the biggest commercial holiday outside of Christmas. Yeah, totally. Yeah. One, of the things I, one of the things I love about your book, it was speaking of that, is you mentioned some of the earliest scenes of Halloween, uh, which I actually had no idea, the, the back in the silent era of uh, certain things that are Halloween-esque or there's like a party or something. And that was so cool. You know, there's also a really cute scene, uh, Halloween scene in Meet Me in St. Louis, St. Louis, which people hey, forget Louis. from 1950. <laughs> Come on. It's, it, I've got the song in my head, you know. <laughs> this is directed by Vincent Minnelli with Judy Garland and Margaret O'Brien. And of course, we're classic the Halloween end. movie. Yes, yes. Well, there's this, a, it's, <laughs> it's an absolutely accurate uh, yeah. picture of how Halloween was uh, uh, celebrated, especially by kids in uh, at, at that at turn of the century time, 1903. Right. Yes, Louis. yes, it was. And that's important for this <laughs> Halloween essentials topic. True. And yes. Every, everybody who loves Halloween loves that movie and they bring it up again and again and again. Be- because maybe Matt's not familiar with it. Oh, that's not. Oh, I've seen it. I've watched it. Okay. Yes. Because there's this great little scene where Margaret O'Brien is a little girl. She plays Tootie and she and her sister, they go on out to have a, a Halloween. And it's not like, Hey, we're going to knock on a door and say trick or treat. This is something where you kind of did little pranks or you threw flour at people to kind of yeah, the trick. You know, yeah, right. that's, that was the whole trick thing. Yeah. And, and my understanding, David, was originally the producer of the film actually wanted to take it out. They wanted to take out that Halloween sequence because they go, you know, nothing really happens. This is making the film too long. And it was Vincent Minnelli that said, no, 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 we must have that Halloween scene in there. And thank, thank goodness he fought for that and it stayed. And like you said, it is a great yeah. representation of what Halloween was like back then. Right. Same studio wanted to take uh, over the rainbow out of the Wizard of Oz. You know, I mean, uh, it, uh, yeah, and it's it's uh, yeah. The, the, what is the, that? It just doesn't make sense. It's some guy behind a desk somewhere over the rainbow. It's just more sky. <laughs> well, well, you understand. The, the Where's attitude the rainbow? Was, yeah. Look, the attitude was hey, it's a girl. She's just singing in the in the farm. I mean, that's not interesting. It doesn't advance the story any. So, so I mean, I I understand. Then who would have known that that song would turn into like the the blockbuster song that it that it has become? But. Uh, Getting back to your book, I do love this thing where you you list a movie, one of the 31 essentials, and then you do put the, if you enjoyed this, you might also like that. Because yeah. you mentioned some things that, oh my gosh, I, I didn't even think about that film. So it's really a great book. And the thing I also love about it is the size. It's not like a giant, huge, you know, coffee table book. It's a really great size book. And it's 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 not that expensive. And it's And it's also... We, as being hardcore horror fans, we're familiar with these movies, but it's a great primer for the uninitiated as well as a good companion to celebrating Halloween. I also see that this is the type of thing that, you know, if you're you're a monster kid, an adult monster kid, and maybe you've got your kids who are maybe right at that age where they can finally start seeing something that's a little creepy. They're not like three years old or anything like that. And this is a good way to just slowly kind of initiate them into these classics. And I love the fact that most of these are older films because I feel like every kid now is going to have some sort of access to all the more modern, you know, saw and everything else. Yeah. Uh, right. But to see these movies and, and to sit a kid down before they're tainted by the world and go, look, this is a good movie. This is yeah. what we did with atmosphere and, and right. you know, and, a and shoe string. Like, right. Like you have universal in there, you have hammer, you have some William castle, you know, it's like yeah. Hitchcock, you know, Bava. I mean, it's, it is a nice, selection and again they're all very different films but but perfect halloween viewing 
Well, it wasn't easy to uh, you know arrive at, at, at the final list. I mean, I'm the, sure. The oh, ultimate, well, yeah, that's the major reason for the also rans. But yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, sure. The uh, I I was the primary uh, selector, but people at uh, at Turner also had their favorites and their ideas, and so we had sure. to keep going around and and whittling down this this list, and then finally he said, "Look, we can't pretend this is going to be a comprehensive book. You know, this right. this is this is not an encyclopedia." It is an introduction, especially for people. I mean, I have two different kinds of audiences. I have casual readers who just enjoy horror movies and uh, get a kick out of uh, out, out of my books. And uh, but most of my um, my best known books are they're they're lengthy explorations of the uh, cultural meanings and nuances of of these movies, which turn off some readers who think I kind of take all the fun out of out of monsters but uh, this one is a kind of a gift if you if you look to the uh, dedication page there is the Frankenstein monster and in big it's the largest dedication pipe I've ever uh, put in a book but it says uh, for monster kids everywhere yes. you know who you are yeah. <laughs> and that, that was the fun of this because yeah. I got to just kind of slow down you when, when you're Doing a survey book, I've done a lot of these, you can only devote so many paragraphs to an individual film. Right. And the horror genre is really kind of vast. But here I can just kind of oh, yeah. slow down and talk about one film. And it's, it's beautifully printed and designed. Yes. And the, uh, as usual, for me, one of the fun things is digging up pictures that I've never seen before or yes. very few people have seen before. Yes. Was, and, it, was, it a, was it a challenge, David, to like, I mean, these are some of these are just you know, classic films that have been talked about a lot, but just a challenge to kind of obviously want to give the gist and the basics of these films and also to just to say something new about it or come at them with a slightly different angle for this book. Yeah, I kind of emptied my head right. with each entry and uh, started doing, you know, finger exercises and just uh, mm-hmm. my usual way of writing is I, I do a lot of scribbling and doodling on legal pads and mm-hmm linking up, uh, you know, phrases with arrows and smiley faces and whatever, you know, I do. And then I, then I take the pile of paper and I go to the, go to the word processor. But this was, it was a lot of fun to do. And I did that with the monster show. I think I succeeded in communicating my particular passion for the, uh, for the genre. Mm-hmm. And maybe that was more of what uh, what they meant to me, and this one is uh, what they might mean to you. Uh, right. oh, I, right. I'm assuming you don't know anything about about these movies, but you're uh, you're literate and intelligent, and and understand the basics of popular culture and and Hollywood. And I did get to use a lot of anecdotes that uh, did not find their way into many of my previous books. There's always something to discover. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's uh, what's a photograph you've never seen. There's a beautiful, uh, uh, the opening page of the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde mm-hmm. thing. There is an unpublished, uh, never before seen uh, image of Frederick March coming up the stairs holding his cane. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the treasures of this book. Um, you, there- you know, David, one of the things I love about this book, it, it's a couple of things. You know, you mentioned finding things that no one else has seen. I noticed that in your special thanks section, you give a thanks to Ron and Margaret Borse. They supplied, I guess, a lot of posters for you because there's like a Frankenstein poster picture, uh, a Dracula poster picture that I haven't seen before. And also you provide some great little like pinup, early pinup pictures too of uh, like the early days of Halloween, Claire Bow and, just some really cute pictures of sexy oh, ladies from like a, in a, by a pumpkin or by a spooky cat or something. Oh, yeah, I love those. I love, those that. I love Yeah, those me books. too. Yeah. I, I was kind of disappointed one didn't work its way on, onto the cover, but uh, because there's something so iconic about, you know, it says Hollywood and Halloween at the, at the same time. No, Ron and Margaret, they're our old friends. Ron started helping me way back with, uh, I think it was Hollywood Gothic or was it the Monster Show was the first. But we've been we work, we've worked together on every one of my mm-hmm. my books, That's and great. now we uh, live together in the same part of the world. Uh, he's mm-hmm. in Van Nuys, I'm in Glendale, California. 
uh, within striking distance. And for this book, um, once more, you know, he threw open the gates to his uh, unbelievable awesome. collection. Oh. And so did uh, Turner Classic Movies. They have <gasps> this. They're no. A, they're a class act. Oh, the yeah. Turner, the Turner uh, archive was a source of many. Uh, you can see exactly where in the, uh, the photo credits page where each mm -hmm. picture came from. Mm -hmm. And a lot are just things I've been collecting and holding on to and haven't mm -hmm. uh, used. But there are over 200 photos. There are some that you've seen before, but I hope they're the the best, sharpest, clearest prints you've ever seen. Right. And I wanted to kind of create the experience of, you know, leafing through uh, one of those old issues of, of famous monsters. People, I'm getting very nice feedback on this, and people really genuinely seem to be enjoying themselves. And that, that's great. I think, like I said, I think you're reaching... Writer, it's, it's so nice to know that people are really uh, truly appreciating in a... Uh, sure. Because it can appeal, to, it can appeal to the hardcore, you know, academic fans as well as, like you said, the casual viewer. One one uh, fan letter I get variations on it. I have been for the last thirty years. It's it's like uh, I always thought these movies were important, and you've proved it to the world. <laughs> and I, right, right. Or you know, or I was, you know, I got flack from my parents and. <laughs> and my teachers, my friends. Yeah. But yeah. I knew there was something important about this. And so I'm 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 validated apparently a lot of people's interest <laughs> right. in these films. And I uh, yes, absolutely. I validate you. For some of your hardcore readers too who are really into the historical details, do you get often people saying, Oh no, you're you're not right about that one quote or you spelled somebody's name wrong. I mean, it seems like for the real hardcore fans, they can be like really nitpicky like that. Yes, <laughs> and, they, and they can uh, and they can ambush you. On a, oh, that's fun! Read yeah. an event like this one, um, you know, I, <laughs> and you haven't done it so far. So hey, no. Well, no, okay, no. okay. So I've got, I've got, oh, here we go. Oh, here we oh, go. Boy, here go. I've got I've got a really really nerd question, David. Okay. Uh, you're a historian. I, I see you've got Young Frankenstein as one of the movies you spotlit, which is which is awesome because it's yeah, we a beautiful all love homage. That. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Now at the at the end of the first Frankenstein, there's the toast. Here's to a bride to the son of Frankenstein. And everybody goes, here, here. And then he raises his glass again and he goes, here's to young Frankenstein. So I don't know if you have any idea about this, but that isn't yep. both of those are incorrect. He, the, the line is, uh, here's to a son of the house of Frankenstein. That's it. Oh! Aha. oh. Ah, in your face. Schooled. In your face, Gonus. <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, and that, I stand corrected. No, and that's, uh, <laughs> that scene was added on at the, uh, after the film was, was really? completed. Oh, really? They brought the actors back. They wanted to show that uh, Henry had not, uh, had not died. Oh, and, wow. Huh. And so they gave it a happy ending, or the, the semblance of a happy ending. Ah. And uh, I don't think they were planning a sequel, but they were no. afraid that it was just too right. downbeat. After hitting that blade of the windmill, <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I at least have a little trouble walking or something. Yeah, yeah, he, <laughs> he, he does. Have... Yeah, he does make a pretty speedy recovery. He Not does. a scratch. Yeah. Well, but but, he, but they. They, they do say here's to young Frankenstein, right? I mean, do you, you think that Gene Wilder might have been so impressed with those films that he wanted to call the script Young Frankenstein based just on that little reference? It, that reference wasn't there. Here's he to a son say, of no, he doesn't. It doesn't say Young Frankenstein. <laughs> the very last, like the very last line in the film, he doesn't. No, say it's, it was Gene. Gene Wilder uh, came up with the title all by himself. Wow! Okay. I you see. I've lived my life with a misconception. <laughs> you've been right. living. You've Thank been you. living a lie. <laughs> I guess. That? Well, I guess. this is the last episode featuring James <laughs> Gonis on Monster Party. So I, I have to throw. In you my hear head. something in your head, and it's uh, not the way it actually was. I've done, I've done this sure. myself. I hate yeah, when that happens. I've, I've misquoted. Hey. Dialogue. Okay. I've. Uh, <laughs> I remember a, a absolutely crazy conversation I had with somebody who insisted that he had seen one of the creature sequels and it was the creature walks humongous <laughs> <laughs> and there was nothing and he said yes that was the title and i could not disabuse him of that notion wow wow Jeez. that's dangerously humongous, close humongous. to the porn title 
<laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's crazy. Okay, wow. but I, yeah, so I, now I, I want to watch that again now, James, to see that. How but James, that James you're, not, you're, you're not a bad person for <laughs> misremembering that line. I just want you to know that. Look, wow. Look, 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 look who Please, amongst us? Don't, look, yes. Who don't let this us keep us you up. No, look, who amongst us <laughs> hasn't gotten a line wrong? Okay? Always. Look, yeah. look I, well, I, no, my, I, my burning question has been answered, so now I can sleep. Sure, sure. I can't uh, remember the lyrics of any song. I so I've learned over the years. Song that I've heard a million times, and then I'll start singing it. Sure, sure. And it's always wrong. <clears throat> but Dave, I was I would say that you know, thirty-one titles that you chose. Like, Again, I'm, like you said, I'm sure it was very difficult to come down, to, to whittle it down. But the 31 main ones, I'm going to be honest, every single film in that book of the 31 main ones, I am a big fan of, except one. <laughs> well, um, no. I, but, I, but, but, but I, w- I, I want to know what that one. 30 of them I, I've watched many, many times, and I will, they are classics in their own way. There's just one that, like, eh, it's okay. You've got, you've got us curious. You have to. You, yeah. What is it? I have to know. Hocus Pocus. Mm. Oh. <laughs> I, I, not that I don't oh. dislike the movie. I just don't. It's not a movie that I go back to. Uh, okay. me, I, kind, I kind of don't get the love People for that run movie. hot and cold in that film. Yes, but they, they really they do. do run hot. Yes. And that was the reason we did it, because yeah. the, the, the fan base is right. almost rabid. I it, mean, they, abs- no, absolutely. It's kind of, th- that movie is kind of the way I feel about, there are certain films that my age, I was either too old or not old enough to regard as like game changers from my generation. Like two other films that um, have so much love and cult following that I just don't really have is Gremlins and Goonies. I don't think yeah. they're terrible. I don't think they're terrible movies. I just they don't have the magic quality that uh, other films have of that kind. And that's where I think Hocus Pocus falls for me. It's I like think Gremlins is better than Goonies. Yes, yes, but uh, and you know, but there are fam- there are people who are at that a- right age. Gremlins is like, oh yeah, it's their magical movie. It's yeah. their Christmas movie, you know. And you know, I've seen it again recently, and yeah, so it's okay. But it just doesn't, you know, it's not like whereas like the thing or Halloween or Nightmare on Elm Street or all the other ones in your book, I I can I can never get enough of. Well, one thing we we did want to do is uh, include films that were uh, uh, family friendly. Sure, sure. Because I, I, if I would would do my uh, my personal, absolute personal best in terms of uh, the films that obsess me and gratify me the most, it would be so dark. It would be <laughs> really. <laughs> like, oh like, yes. Like, well, like, what are some examples? Like, yeah, yeah. David, David, give us a couple. You, okay, just say, more, if, you, you, if you took out Hocus Pocus just to satisfy <laughs> Sean, what would you have replaced it with in the darker version of? Right favorites. That's what there, I want. There know. probably is a list somewhere that I sure, do not have sure. handy at, at the moment. But yeah, it's a, you know, it's a it's a balancing act. It's a juggling act. Sure. Uh, I think the book is going to probably do pretty well. Maybe better than some of my more uh, flagship books, only because uh, they've really thought about the audience. Mm. There was a lot of talk. They were very very smart people in their marketing and PR departments, and. Uh, it really was a collaborative uh, effort. They didn't leave me just hanging out in the wind to, uh, they didn't say, here's a half million dollars. What can you, <laughs> right, sure, they really did sure. not say, here's a half million dollars. Sure, and there but, are some but, films in that book that are really scary. I mean, you know, The Thing is a pretty terrifying yeah, film with sure. some yeah. horrifying sequences. Oh, the that, that it, yeah. that it, I mean, there are scenes in that film that are so frightening because of just the ingenuity of the makeup effects mixed with like, oh my God, I've never seen anything like that before. <laughs> right, right. And now now you have. And now you have, <laughs> right, yeah. Right. Over right. and over and over. Sure. And, but yes, but yes. the, uh, it was, it was, no, it was a, a groundbreaking film in terms of practical special effects. It, no, it's uh, one of my favorites. Nothing like it uh, before. Uh, CGI is just totally. Yeah. Uh, Ruined oh, yeah. everything. I know, it really has. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, some ways. Well, don't you think, don't you guys think? In some it, ways. It, in it, some it, ways, like yes. When you use it correctly. Sure. Uh, Correct, yes. It's like don't sparingly or, yes. or combined with physical Combined, effects. yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. If you want to smooth out some edges, that's fine. But right. there's nothing, I mean, I keep going back to the thing maybe every six months. And I look at that yeah. film yeah. and it feels just as fresh and scary 
And, you know, there's your eye notices when something is physically real, you know, know, as opposed to a computer generated image, you know, and when, when I watch a movie that has just all those kind of effects, especially when it's like computer blood effects, Mm-hmm. That I just don't get at all. Yeah. It just pulls me out of it entirely. I don't. I have no emotional connection. But also, Matt, we've we talked about this using the thing as an example. Here you have uh, the thing from 1980, the, the 80s version, the John Carpenter version, where you have all these practical effects, and then there's the later version, which is supposed to be the prequel, the thing. Right. And look, the actors are good. But all but the CGI, it's, but it's forgettable. But everything yeah, about the movie is the forgettable. The story's forgettable too, though. Yeah, 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 but also just the the creature effects in it. It just seems it just seems so bland, or yeah. or you just know it's yeah. not physically real there. Or maybe it's the CGI. I, I'm not really sure if it's the CGI or the design, but it's there's just a combination about it. of things. There's, yeah. there's also a style of filmmaking too that you don't really see as much anymore. People use it now as kind of an homage, but when you go back to films from like the seventies where, you know, you're filming a horror movie and it almost has like a documentary feel to it that makes it even creepier. Like, Oh my God, did this really happen? Right. You know, Chainsaw is a perfect example. We've mentioned yeah. that before. Or Night of the Living uh, Dead. Night of the Living Dead, yeah. Right. And uh, speaking of which, your list of films, now if you had to pick just one, like let's say we're all going to get together, we're going to watch a movie right now, one right off the top of your head. What's a good one? Just like, this is what I'm feeling right now. What would it be? Well, something I actually just looked at, Tim Burton's Sleepy Hollow. <laughs> Oh, Love that you know, movie. That, that's so funny. My wife and I j- literally just watched that last week because really, it's underrated. Of, it is one of Tim Burton's best genre yeah. films. Over yeah, there. And yes. it's, it it demonstrates something that uh, a very uh, a light, judicious use of CGI. There, uh, yes, there is can be one, so effective. It, yeah. It's a uh, it is a gorgeous. That's one of those. It is lovely to look at horror movies I've ever seen. It really is. It's overall, there is just one moment in that film where I thought the CGI was too much. It's it's once like when you watch the movie, you'll know exactly. Oh, I know. I know exactly. It's it's uh, it's like one moment he goes into cartoonish. Tim. Yes. yes, And it's literally, it's like five seconds, but those five seconds, it's like, why they just use practical makeup effects? Why? Because the other, the rest of the use of CGI, as far as like the backgrounds and the location is fine but he almost like he literally ruined the moment in that one scene it's like "Mm, why'd you do it but otherwise it's a beautiful film yeah that that jumped out at me too when i uh, watched it last week but i um immediately kind of suppressed it yeah and me too (laughs) yeah hey you know this this is really a fantastic it's a beautiful art direction and yeah and it's a great story it's a clever rework kind of like elaboration on the sleepy hollow story i thought it was because of yeah. nice twists it was really good yeah no it's the it's one of the very first american um short stories and right, uh, right. it's fascinating that uh, and, and rip van winkle too you know the the fantastic and the imagination have been with us uh, we've been entertaining ourselves from the very very beginning in this country and oh yeah I'm writing something about Washington Irving and, and Sleepy really? Hollow right oh, wow. now. And if there's going to be a Fright Features 2, Fright mm-hmm. Favorites sure. 2, please let me get my title. Straight <laughs> <laughs> Fright Favorites 2, uh, Sleepy Hollow, I think would be high in my. Oh, oh it's, yeah. And it's a perfect Halloween film. Well, can, well, can I ask you, David? I know one thing is kind of interesting in your, your selection year wise you kind of make a pretty big jump from Scream in 1996 to Get Out in 2017. Do you have any titles that maybe almost made the list as far as stuff that was made in the 2000s that you consider, you know, uh, worthy of this uh, of this uh, collection? You know, I would have liked to have Ed Wood in there, but we... Oh, sure. Tim right. Burton's no, very well represented probably, here. Probably what, his, his other great movie to me. Yeah. Probably yeah. my favorite, I would yeah. say. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. And I would throw in, like, again, if I was doing my list, some Cronenberg. But that's not exactly family friendly. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Well, he he does not. A book like this is not going to be completely family friendly. Yeah. Right. Of course. Of course not. Yeah. I will say, look, my my daughter's 15 and she loves seen horror movies and we had yeah, you've, thing about you've raised watching, her well as yeah, a monster kid yeah. watching yeah. the exorcist the great thing about your book that i love 
is it's it, like I said, it's a great general overview. And so we were going to start to go through it and go, okay, we've seen this, seen this, seen, oh, we need to see this one. Right. That's you great. know, and that's the great thing about your book that I, that I love so much, but it's funny because now she's, she's pestering me. She's going, <laughs> when, when a, a topic comes up about a certain film, oh, I don't know. She goes, Hey, I've seen the exorcist. So if I saw that, I could see anything, you know, she's getting to that <laughs> stage. I'm like, ah, yeah. Well, show her, show her hereditary then and see. If she- <laughs> oh, <laughs> so happy. That's, that's I'm so happy she- you brought that up. Yeah, that's one that I could could have fit in that list too, because that's as a modern horror film that's so effective. Another one I put in there would be yeah, Session, I- Session Nine. That's Session a great- Nine's a great movie. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good one. Maybe but, uh, uh, the the Babadook. Sure. Babadook's great. Sure. Oh yeah, yeah that uh, Babadook that was definitely there. And uh, Cronenberg, I uh, would have used, happily used uh, any number of his things, but yeah, we had the thing in there, and I think that yeah. kind of occupied the. Like the yeah, body the horror. Body horror, horror yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, also yeah. a big fan of the movie The Descent. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a good one. It's a classic yeah. one. Yeah, you recommended that. My daughter loves that film, by the way. <laughs> good. Yeah, yeah. It's just but she's, fun. We, it's funny because she goes, you know, Matt likes those really gory films, doesn't he? And I go, well, <laughs> you know. It's, I have many shades. That's the Uncle Matt. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So the, the, the one thing I'm having to tell people, people are just assuming because it's a Turner Classic Movies book and that's every day in October that these are the films that are being, uh, being shown. Oh, right. yeah, yeah. And right. a lot of them will be. In fact, one sure. night, uh, but they're, give, they're giving the book one night to itself. And uh, oh. Dave Carger and I are going to introduce four. Oh, nice. Oh, that's so cool. Awesome. Oh, we're we're nice. choosing one from, there's going to be one from the 30s, one from the 40s. One from the fifties and one from the sixties. That's, nice. That's great. That's great. Nice. And, That's great. Uh, if you want to, if you want to guess what they might be, uh, mm. feel free. Thirties, I would say maybe Frankenstein. I'm not confirming or denying it. Yeah, <laughs> okay. well, I, I'm going to say I, Rosemary's I, Baby for the. 60s. I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I'd yeah, say since, since there's only since there's only two main ones in the in your forties selection. I'm guessing you'll go with Val Luton's Cat People rather than The Wolfman because you already have a universal for the 30s one. And maybe, and maybe, and but, since Creature is also universal, maybe you'll go with, wow. and you want to get a hammer in there, I would say maybe either Christopher Frankenstein or Horror of Dracula for the 50s. That's yeah, I, I need to call my bookie. <laughs> okay, but I, I, I just want to say one thing here. What What's so cool is if, if listeners go to the Turner Classic Movies website where they show the schedule and you can kind of get the whole layout for all of October. Yes. What's so cool, Sean, is Creature from the Black Lagoon. They're going to show it like three times. Really? Three, oh, great. yes. Because people love it. Of course. People it's love classic. the creature. Of course, yes. Yes. Of course. Who doesn't love That's the cool. creature? Come on. Who, who doesn't love the creature? I, I have yet to meet someone who goes, ah, you know the creature? I don't know. Water? Not, I mean, no. I, no. <laughs> That's just wrong. Well, all I can say is that you got one of the four correct. <laughs> All right. Ooh. Okay. Ooh. So, so the best thing uh, for us uh, to do we're, is... We're going uh, to be uh, recording this next week. And they, haven't, <laughs> they haven't told me what day uh, they're going to do this, but there are four films. They're on the shorter side, so we could get four into, a, into one evening. Right. Uh, so, well, I like them. That's all I can do. <laughs> well, speaking of this, I mean, I think that I love Turner Classic Movies. I think we all do, but... They've got their film noir guy and they have people who do, you know, uh, cover a lot of the classic films, but there needs to be a horror guy. That's true. Yeah, actually. yeah you're right. I'm just saying, David. David, <laughs> maybe. You know what, David? When you go to go get taped, you know, go, hey, hey, guys, look, well, why don't we get a horror guy? I, I'm available. I can do this. I know all about <laughs> these horror films. Unless, of course, they go, well, you got to put on the cape and be all creepy. You know, I'm sure you could do Would that. you do that? Yeah, would you do that? <laughs> Not with the cape. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell people this you know, story. I, I often, because I do all this Dracula stuff, people ask if I'm going to do a lecture in makeup or a, a, will you wear a cape? And, and I say no. And there's a real good reason because, you know, when I was doing the Dracula documentary for Universal, I got a chance to uh, play with uh, Lugosi's original cape. Bela oh Jr. brought it over to the studio. No. And, oh my God. and it, it's there. I'm the one who pinned it up on the, the Taylor's dummy that we, we oh used. And it was, God. and I did try it on. <gasps> wow. 
And uh, as I had with Christopher Lee's cape from Horror of Dracula, which wow. the Dracula wow. Society in London has. And in both Crazy. occasions, it was, uh, I was really happy nobody had a camera. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> because it looked on, it looked like something on Lugosi and Christopher Lee, like they did not look on me. You know, uh, I, right. they're, uh, they were, you know, 6'2", six 6'3". Six I, uh, right. I'm 5'7". I, <laughs> I get it. Regal on them, it looked like a collapsed circus tent. And so, you know, short guys can't wear capes, but we can uh, no, write yeah. books about people. Who I yeah. believe me, I'm 5'7". I've given up capes. You know, it, it's funny <laughs> you should say that, David, because on a recent trip to Japan where we all went, we all had the opportunity oh, yeah. to try on a jacket that belonged to Lon Chaney Jr. in one of his films. And the funny oh, thing oh, is, right. it, he, he was a big dude. And of course, when we all tried it on, we're all like, hey, and the same type of thing, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm like one of the people who lives in a shoe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. Shoe's too big to fill. Yeah. But it was fun. Next, yeah. year, next year, everybody will be able to uh, stand next to Lugosi's cape because it's going it's going to be part of the permanent installation at the Motion Picture Academy uh, Museum. Oh, wow. Wow. Awesome. That was announced uh, not long ago and uh, that's nice. That's, that's very exactly exciting. where it belongs. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. You know, the one thing about Turner Classics too is I what I appreciate about that channel, although it's been around so long now, and it has stayed tried and true to what it has always been. I mean, we've seen AMC change from a classic oh. movie channel. We've seen the, the Fox movie channel is going away. Like Turner Classics is like literally the only cable or channel of that type that gives the love to these yeah. movies. Yeah, right. They understand the uh, the value of a brand yes. and they have, yes. they really clung to theirs and they, yes. they do a fantastic job. Really yeah, do. remember when A&E was arts and entertainment? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, I, I know. Do. I know. I mean, yeah. AMC was like showing classic movies, no commercials. I mean, it was like, right. yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, I know we have all the other media at our disposal, so Still. it's great. But there's something about just turning on the Turner Classic Movies any time, the day or night, and there's yeah. a great old movie on. You know? To feel like it has an identity, you yeah. know, as opposed mm-hmm. to just a series of shows that yeah. they're desperately I, trying to get you to watch. It does. Yeah. The, 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 the network has its personality, and you are mm-hmm. sharing that as much as any individual film and uh, i love just turning it on at odd hours and yeah seeing a film that i've i never heard of before yeah something still, from the 30s. still with all with all our right with all our knowledge and, and history and love of the stuff they still show stuff that i've never heard of and i i, I get totally pulled in yeah and, the short, and the short, the short subjects are just i was just about to say yes, yes the short subjects i love the They're fact fantastic. that that now has a place where they can live yes. Yes. And, a, and a lot of material that's not otherwise been released yet no on dvd or blu-ray no. And one of the things that, that I love, and I know Matt probably does, is some people would think, oh, Turner Classic Movies, just, well, classic old things from the 30s and 40s. No, not at all. They've got stuff from the 60s and the 70s, and they're oh, yeah. there's a new section, they're exploitation films. Yeah, that was great. Short, that's the thing that blew my mind. TCM yeah. Underground, yeah. Yeah. Great. They'll show, yeah. like, you know, right. Roger Corman films, drive-in yeah. films, and that's great. And you Yeah, it's like, I, I love that the uh, Criterion Collection now, they have all kinds of things they <laughs> They wouldn't have had before, but yeah. uh, things that are genre classics. They, they put out an entire Godzilla set, which is amazing. <laughs> uh, all the Godzilla films in the 50s and 60s, yeah. Yeah, we love the big guy. Yeah. Now, this is a Halloween, a pre-Halloween episode. Yeah. And we've talked about costumes a little bit. We've talked about candy. What about decorations? I know, you know, Larry is a big fan of, he has these things called motionettes, and uh, and they're lovely, and he always displays them uh, every Halloween. David, do you fix up your house around Halloween? Do you uh, do yeah. any oh, like? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I've got. Uh, I have three uh, life-size skeletons, posable nice. skeletons wow. that I try to come up with um, a different wardrobe for, uh, <laughs> a different motif. Nice. What's this year? <laughs> I haven't decided yet. Oh, okay. But uh, it may it may be drag. It may be, I, I love it. it. Nice. Love it. Like, like burlesque feather Halloween. boas. Yeah, feather boas. And, and, uh, That's cool. And uh, sparkly pasties or something. <laughs> Rip cage. <laughs> right. uh, I don't know. We'll have fun with it. I mean, you know, what's really funny is that 
this Halloween is like uh, none other in my lifetime. Oh, right. Yeah. It's right. going to be mostly it's, virtual. It and, is. I know. Yeah. They, yeah. When, I, when I did my book about the history of Halloween, I talked to people all over the country. And one thing that they said over and over is, you know, it's my favorite holiday because it's the one time we really get together with the neighbors and have fun. Yeah, mm. I know. Socializing, and, you're right. And this year, it's going to all be virtual. I know. And, uh, I'm going to have I, some I, candy ready. I mean, I'm sure there'll be a yeah. couple, and I will wear my yeah, mask. Yeah. And, yes. You yeah, know, yeah. And I'll have it on the end of a stick, you know. And yes. Like, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I understand people are going all out with, you know, yard and house decorations sure. and maybe a drive-by, you know, kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. In, in the manner of what you do with, um, at Christmas, you don't go knocking door to door. You Right, know, right. Exactly. Drive-by. Ironically, this, this Halloween will be unprecedented that more pop- population than ever before will be wearing masks. They're just <laughs> different true. kinds of masks. That's right? true. Oh, yes. Right. I, have, yeah. I have some already uh, specially picked out for... Nice uh, before Halloween. <laughs> nice. I want to put a filter in a face hugger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, alien face hugger. Oh, that's that's, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the one yard decoration that I've never been entirely down with is the inflatable one. The thing is, they all look too cute. It's almost more too more for Christmas. Wait, wait a minute. For... Wait a minute. See, see, the the David. These are the guys who are like, let's put a bloody arm in here. Well, and... right. Yeah, it's Halloween. But, let's but, make it scary. <laughs> no, but, I want to scare the shit out of a kid. But look, <laughs> yeah. sometimes little kids to go trick or treating. Maybe you don't want to go that creepy. You know, I that, think I do. You know, or have things pop out at people. You know, that's a I love that thing. stuff. I'll go to like Spirit Halloween. Oh yeah. I love all the animatronic stuff. Yes. Animatronic mm-hmm. skeleton or a werewolf. And it's elaborate now, too. Yeah, no, they do some really good work. Yeah. But there's one that I think I want to buy this year because it was the most effective in the store. And it's a hopping spider. And it's this <laughs> yeah. big spider that just sits there. And then all of a sudden, it'll just lunge out. <laughs> and... I mean, I, I saw about three or four kids who just did not see it coming, like leap out of their shoes, like a, like in a comic strip. And uh, yeah, I think I need that on my lawn because but you see, but you see, I need people the, off my lawn, basically. Look, here's the thing. When you got some little little girl who's dressed up as, as you know, a princess and she's, she's like five years old walking up, you, you don't want to make it so terrifying that it damages their mind. Go, I don't want to trick or treat. It's horrifying. There's that creepy house. And, but isn't know, that the, isn't that the ultimate compliment of your true to terrify display yeah it's like oh that that kid won't even come up the driveway no 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 see i like to i like to do it in such a way where, where i have the motionettes you know they move and they're not too scary and i have a nice little light on it and it's in the window so they can kind of gently come up and kind of look at it Ooh, ooh. you know i'm not gonna have anything leap out at them because I, I want them to have a nice positive experience i have a comic friend named bill dwyer and uh he would tell me that he would do this thing where he would dress up like a scarecrow or something and he would sit in a chair and then just be completely still. And then the kid would come up and he'd just get out of the chair. <laughs> would, talk about something that will just scar a kid for life. But, but I also admire the ingenuity of that. Sure. There's lots of ways, just like the films themselves. You can go the subtle Val Luton way. Sure, yeah. Or you could go the gonzo all out Stuart Gordon way. True. You know? <laughs> can do it. There should be, yeah, I want a blood splash zone yeah. in front of my house. <laughs> See, I, the only problem with that is I do think, you know, you won't be visited very much. I think there's always oh, yeah? the kids who will be a little <laughs> older. He goes, he goes, hey, you know, the 14-year-old, hey, look, at, let's go to that house. But I think the little kids might go, that's too scary. I don't want to go. The there. little kids won't. But I think that if word got around that this place is horrifying, mm-hmm. there'd be a lot of like, <laughs> okay, well, I think I can take it. Let's see. Sure. But then you, you, you get the hooligans. Yeah, the hooligans. But you know, you bring up a good point. I think th- this year it is going to be different. David says, it, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's 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 like some counties are saying, look, we don't recommend you do it, but if you do, yeah. it, you got to be really safe. Yeah. But that's that. why we have to be here to kind of keep the spirit going. You know, we yeah, have that's to, right. It's on your mindset. I mean, I think you mentioned in in the book, David, about why not have Halloween every day of the year. Well, for some of us, we. Do live that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everybody's, everybody here. <laughs> yeah, totally. the, uh, 
you know, usually I'm out uh, traveling in, in uh, October a lot at colleges and fan conventions, and um, I'm going to miss that. I mean, yeah. I'm going to be meeting yeah. people and interacting like we're doing right now. Right. But, you know, you're a writer. You don't uh, interact with your, your <laughs> readership very much. Yeah. Right, right. And, uh, but it, it becomes a big event uh, for my kind of the book kind of books I write. Yeah. And uh, this year, you know, uh, you, you got Fright Favorites and you've got right. your favorite streaming services and you've got, uh, you, you can have a kind of a camaraderie of uh, isolation. <laughs> <laughs> That's strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, We're all you know, in this together, but not entirely. But David, yeah. it, this is not, this is not going to be the way it's going to be forever. You know, it, things will get better eventually. Now you, you mentioned going to conventions. Is there a convention that you, that you really like to go to? Is there one that you go, Oh, this is like one of my favorites. Like hopefully future ones coming up. Well, I, I was, uh, I was a regular at a uh, Scaricon up in, uh, uh, Syracuse for oh, wow. a number of years. I really en- enjoyed that. And Monsterama, I was supposed to go this year. Right. And uh, they held on till the very last minute before they right. they, they canceled. But we're going to do a virtual. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, we, we've done Monster Palooza a lot. In fact, we've actually had a Monster Party booth at a couple of Monster Paloozas. And um, I mean, we're hoping it's still going to happen next year in October. But um, it, yeah, um, it, it, they did. Um, uh, Midsummer Scream. Uh, uh, yes. one yeah, that's a fun one. one. Yeah, in August. It's in August, but it uh, you know looks forward to it. It's it's the biggest Halloween theme convention uh, mm-hmm. out there. And this year it was just one day of uh, you know on, online panels and and Zoom sessions, and right. I was was part of that again. But I guess this uh, medium is going to be part of our uh, part of our lives. It might for a uh, while at least. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no pressure, but. Before the whole pandemic thing happened, we would have our guests in person. We would they'd come to our place and we'd have yeah. food and we'd maybe, you know, if a couple drinks if you wanted to. And w- that was part of the monster party. So maybe after this yeah. whole thing clears, maybe we could have you, and love to have you back, over yes. and, uh, yeah. you know, see you face to face. I'd love to. I'd love to see human beings face to face again. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> I'm not sure of the ones I... I that are uh, staggering around the supermarket. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. they it's so, it's so I odd. Know, I do. There are people I, I know and love, and they're still out there, and uh, we'll all get together again sometime soon. Yeah, totally. Well, David, so this book, Fright Favorites, is available now, correct? It, yes, it's been out in the stores. Uh, I won't be traveling around signing them, but I tell everybody that uh, the wonderful Burbank uh, bookstore Dark Delicacies. Oh yes, we love it. We love it. The official place. You can uh, order copies, and I will personalize uh, uh, awesome. autographs. And nice. uh, I've done. I've signed sixty books there just this week. Wow, it's nice! Kind of, it's kind of a record. So uh, there, there is a hunger for uh, virtual Halloween. I think. Yeah, yeah. But, but but for Absolutely. listeners, if if you are interested, Google Dark Delicacies in Burbank. And it'll come up, and there's an order page that you can go to. Awesome, cool. And is there anything else that you would like to plug? Because yeah, anything uh, coming up? You're um, so plug friendly. You know, the Turner oh, Classic well, movie stuff, of course, and then the Norton uh, critical edition of Bram Stoker's Dracula has really been my best-selling uh, book over the last almost thirty years now, and wow. it's been long overdue for an overhaul and a new edition and new essays and new notes and. Uh, uh, that will be coming out. It was supposed to come out right around Halloween. COVID has uh, slowed down the the production process a bit, but uh, they're on the final proofreading, and it's going to go to the printers soon. And I think uh, this this time around, John Edgar Browning is my co-editor, and I think we have both created you know the edition of Dracula mm. that uh, we both would have loved to have had you know, early on. And we really try to cover every, uh, every critical approach and uh, not going to do this again, because I probably won't be alive the next time <laughs> it's time to do this, but that I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, as an academic text, it really, there's a market that just reinvents itself. It's, it's bottomless. Uh, mm-hmm. None of my other books has sold 200,000 copies. 
but over 30 years, you can do that. With, mm-hmm. uh, right. Wow. The textbook. Uh, and that's it. And I'm, I'm looking forward to actually doing nothing for a bit after. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Right. Watch horror Not films. Not after Halloween, so well. but, you know, it's always Halloween. <laughs> it always comes up against uh, Election Day. Sure. And um, so I think we're probably going to be seeing a lot of... Uh, Speaking uh, of horror, Halloween, politi- <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yes. we're going to see our. It's going to be its own horror show. Yeah. Yeah. All of our pol- politicians and political figures are going to be yes. depicted mm. as monsters in one way or another. Yeah. Oh yeah, yes. And uh, so maybe it's after that I'm going to crawl into a crypt for. <laughs> right. I'll join you. Maybe we join you. Yeah, yeah. Make, make it encrypt for five. Yeah. <laughs> right. Get the double wide. <laughs> well, hey, David, this has been fantastic. I mean, yes, I it hope, has. I hope you've had as much yes. fun as we have because we have totally enjoyed having you. Well, um, thank you. Well, have me on again, and I will get my green screen ready because I've got background. <laughs> oh, sure, like sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, I'd like to raise a glass to uh, Halloween and David J. Scow. Woo-hoo! Yes. Woo-hoo! Virtual, virtual toast you. to young David Scowl. <laughs> <laughs> Long may he live, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Time for a listener shout out. Shout out. Shout out. Shout out. out. This goes out to Javier Pinasco from North Hills, California, who's now the proud cool. owner of a Monster Party t-shirt. Right. Javier! Javier! Oh, oh, yeah! yeah. Javier, nice. Wrote a, wrote Styling. A note. He wrote Javier a note? Wrote, he wrote a note. A note. Said, I've, been lis- I've been listening to you guys for about four years now. I feel cool. like I know you all. I want to oh. thank you for introducing me to monster movies, especially the kaiju genre. Oh, awesome. I, I found you guys through the Japan Trip YouTube video. <laughs> nice. Oh, as wow. I'm, I'm a fan of anything and everything Japanese and have cool. visited quite a few times myself. <gasps> I'm still waiting to see if that Monster Party Japan fan trip materializes. Oh, and if yeah. it does, God. I'm there. Awesome. <laughs> Work yeah, we, we'd like to be there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really. Nobody, nobody in the United States can go there right <laughs> now. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, he says thank you very much for all you guys do and cheers. Well, thank oh, you. That's yeah. nice. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. You. you know what? It it is a dream. We, we'd love to do that. That would be like we can't even imagine how fun that would be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and you never know. You never yeah. know. Could happen. Know. The fact that we yeah. did that trip still yeah. is like that was a dream come true. You know, right. Yeah. Right. Uh, every, all that we did into that period of time, you know. So yeah. And that we're still friends afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was the what was the night? Remember we stayed in the what the cube the the cube hotel? The, oh the, oh, the uh, capsule hotel. Capsule, capsule hotel. Yeah, capsule hotel. But you're right, it was a cube because we got the private room. Like most of the capsules are just like a, a row of them. Caps- yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Single. Yeah. But we could have right. a private room that had a table, but it was still mm-hmm. capsules. Right, yeah. right, right. And they were on top of each other. It was just hysterical because it was like yeah. when you went to bed, it was like you were in the movie Alien and you were getting into your little, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, future cot thing. Yeah. yeah. And then you'd watch two channels of porno <laughs> well, and rock right. yourself to sleep. But, yeah. but look, there, there was there were, they had other channels. You know, there was uh, a news channel. There oh, was, is that was that was true? That would well, oh. that would get you to sleep, huh? Well, it's, oh it's, yeah, it's, it's funny. Fuji Yakamori. It's, it's funny because I didn't tell me find, about Fukushima. I didn't find the adult channels. I just oh, there's news and here's like. Uh, Home economics. What do you mean you didn't they, find them? I mean, I just you didn't. I, you there's there's like eleven channels. You had to go through all of them, and you just yeah. <laughs> nine of what, them were porn. Who channels. are you? <laughs> what? That you don't come upon porn and go. Wait a minute. <laughs> What's this? Maybe I, maybe I, I as I was flipping through, I came across just a, a, like a scene that was uh, you, you know, know what, well, no, what well, to be that. fair, it was meet me meet me in St. Louis was on one of the channels. You the just, porn <laughs> version, uh, yeah, the Japanese porn version. All right, it's yeah. very funny. But I think all point the whole point is Javier. Thank you for buying yes. that shirt. Yes, thank you. And thank you. look, we are we look forward to uh, watching porn in a capsule no. with you. <laughs> Yes. Awesome. Um, also, we have another shout out there too. 
uh, to, this is a long time listener and friend of ours in which we've met at conventions in the past. And this goes out to Jim Jenkins. Oh, Jim, Jim, Jim the, Jenkins. The great Jim Jenkins. Yes. And Jim Jenkins a while back had uh, posted some photos. Jim makes these monster characters, different kind of pop culture characters, but he makes these figures, these custom made like figurines, basically out of paper, out of paper and glue. It's kind of like construction paper, colored construction paper. And you can't believe how he does it. They look amazing. And he had done one for the alligator man in the alligator people, which of course we what? did a commentary on that. And I, um, I had noted it. Uh, I saw it. I think my wife actually is the one who first told me about it. And I saw it on his page and I said, yeah, Jim, this is great. Can we post photos of this alligator man on our monster party Facebook page? <laughs> he said, sure. And we did. And if you go on our Facebook page, monster party page, uh, you can find photos of it. And he actually, he sent it to me. <gasps> what the fuck? So, no. So the alligator man. And again, oh, oh if, you, if you go to the photos, people listening, if you go to the photos or go to Jim's Facebook page to look at how he makes these things, you, at first you can't believe this all out of paper, but they are. They're, Wait, they're, 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 they're stylized. Like they're, he, gave, he gave this to you? Well, he or, sent it to me but he, because he wanted to send to us. Or the, it, yeah, it's it's so, ours, though. It's yes, ours. It's, it's ours, like, Larry. We are, we are physically together, Larry. I want the alligator man to rest in the monster party dead there you go. You know, with all the other stuff. Yeah. So we'll put it in there. That thing looks pretty solid too. It, it is. Amazing. It's. I mean, again, it's. He's done like. Uh, he's done uh, the monster cereals. Uh, he did like Count Chocula, Frankenberry, Blueberry. He's done a Frankenhooker figure, uh, oh, the no. robot I, monster, Mecha Kong. He's done all kinds of ones. I gotta and, see uh, these. They're pretty what amazing. Is- because, like, the thing is, to be honest, like. When it comes to regular action figures, I'm not as into the super deformed stuff, the stylized stuff. So you're already case, shitting on his work. Is that no, what no. <laughs> but these things I love because there's something about the way they're constructed. Yeah, no, paper, it's beautiful. It, they work really well. They're kind of caricatured a little bit, but they're beautiful. So anyway, Jim, wow. thank you so much for um, sending me this and for, to Monster Party because yeah. uh, it's great. And uh, keep keep doing it. And again, check out. On, the, on our page, you can see photos of this. You know, it's funny that you were talking about the stylized thing too, because that figure looks like the model for like an animated series. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to what I don't like about the super deformed ones, I don't like it when it's either it's so deformed that it looks nothing really like what it's right. supposed to be. No, like the pop figures those yes. drive me crazy. No, you're right, but the, he actually makes yeah. it so they're still. Loyal to the look, of right? The, of the but characters. and then the other ones I hate are the ones that are like it's just. It, I guess it's basically just a bobblehead where it's just a giant head. Yeah, yes, on I a agree. teeny body. And right. some of those, some of those I find charming, but most of the time, again, we've discussed this before, and I just I want my figures to look like what they're supposed to be. Yeah. Oh, and and as a bonus, uh, Jim threw in a DVD called Dead Hooker in a Trunk. Oh yeah, <laughs> sure. I, not I think I was yet. in that. So uh, <laughs> once I watch this, I'll pass it on to you guys as well. So thank you oh, again, Jim. Jim, thanks, Jim. We, we really love appreciate you. it. We love and we, we love appreciate your support gifts. of our podcast yeah. too, very much. We, we love getting gifts from our fans. So <laughs> yeah. <thank> you. <laughs> yeah, you know how like most <laughs> podcasts and shows, like please, you know, don't send any. We don't need anything. We, no, but it, no, no, know. we'll take anything you got. We're but, we're, yeah. we're those people. Sometimes it's nice <laughs> if you send four of an item, though. We are so the opposite of the people who don't want anything. We want four. We want four things. Well, there's four of us, you know. Yes. Just send us four stacks of cash. That's yeah. all. Fine. And the same amount of each stack. <laughs> I want my mint. All right. I know we don't normally do in memoriam things, but I would like to mention two people that recently left us that uh, made an impact on me in different ways. One, Chadwick Boseman. Who, mm, yeah, what a shock. Yeah, I know, really. Yeah. Died at such a young age, 43, died of cancer. So good in so many roles. Played Jackie Robinson, James Brown, Thurgood Marshall, and T'Challa in Black Panther. Yeah, Black Panther. He, he really... He kind of reinvigorated that franchise a little bit to me. Too. I agree. Uh, he, he was he's just such a great addition to that whole. Yeah, and uh, from every interview I've ever seen of him, he seems like he was a nice man and yeah. uh, just a 
you know, dedicated to his craft. And so, you know, that's a sad passing. But one that really affected me is someone who I fell in love with as a child. Yeah. And in a way, she's kind of like my first love. And that is Dame Diana Rigg. Diana mm. Rigg. Died at the age of 82. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hit me. I mean, Emma Peel, come on. Yeah. She was the love of my life for many years as a child. Yeah. And the fact that she's died, I know this is going to sound silly, but now I don't have a shot. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I understand. I really do. Yeah, she was, she, so she worked, she worked with so many people to uh, she, Vincent Price. Yeah, theater of, theater, theater of Blood. Theater of Blood. Right. Uh, Only woman but, to have ever married James Bond. Right. right. Contessa yeah. Teresa Di Vincenzo. Wow, right. you are good. <laughs> but also, people will may remember her from the Game of Thrones. Of course, she's fantastic. She a, such she, a I'm, great role. I remember her when yeah. she hosted the Masterpiece Theater, was the Masterpiece Mystery on PBS, and she was the host of that. But you know, the Avengers, though, like, there's, I mean, on my one hand, I can count, you know a number of actresses who just were so like supernaturally gorgeous, you know, mm-hmm. and Diana Rigg in her prime was that to me. She was gorgeous. But the thing that made me really fall in love with her as a child was the fact that not only was she gorgeous, but she was charming. Oh yes. She was yes. smart and she was funny. And physical and too. And then Avengers, you know? Yeah. 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 And yeah. it's like the whole package. It's like your dream girl. I know. Uh, So, yeah, she will really be missed. Absolutely. I would like to give a shout out to two friends of our show, and we love their show, The Velvet Scream Podcasts, Ah. Manuel Canary and Sailor Galavis. Hey. Yeah. These guys, now, Sailor worked on this film, and Manuel is in it, and the film is called Shit and Champagne. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> Shit and champagne. Shit and champagne. This is the first film by San Francisco's famed drag queen Darcy Drollinger. Mm-hmm. And I guess it was a stage show that they made into a movie. Mm-hmm. This is the description of the film. Drollinger stars as the titular Champagne Horowitz Jones Dickerson White. A charismatic stripper who finds herself in danger after her fiancé and half-sister are both murdered. When the cops refuse to investigate, Champagne takes matters into her own perfectly manicured hands to find answers. Wow. How do you like that? That's right out of the headlines. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I watched the trailer of this film, and it just looks great. It's just like everything (laughs) that we love. And so they're going to premiere this film – as part of the Frameline 44 Film Festival. And uh, that's going to happen at the Westwind Solano Drive-In Theater, Thursday, September 17th at 7.30 p.m. And tickets can be purchased at the Frameline.org Festival tickets. So what city and state is this? Where is this happening? This is in Concord, California. Concord, California. Mm, Yes. And so once the film conquers Concord... (laughs) <laughs> you know that it's all the way to the top from there. But uh, we love Manuel and Sailor, and uh, we wish them all the best with this. Absolutely. And, yeah. It looks great. And listen to the Velvet Scream, because it's great, yeah. too. Totally. You know, a little earlier I mentioned uh, Monster Party t-shirts, and you can still buy those on our eBay store, which is Monster Party Store on eBay. Uh, we still have some sizes available, and the Monster Party caps, uh, I understand, are in short supply, but are also still available. There's a few more. So check out our eBay store, Monster Party store, and get some Monster Party merch while the shipping is still free. That's right. We don't know how much longer it's going to be free. But wait, wait, wait. Shipping is free? Yes, Larry. Okay. Shipping is free. You heard me. Free. Oh my gosh. That's and crazy. these shirts and caps are 20 bucks a piece. Oh, such so a with free shipping, that's great. Yeah. And if you have really? a little these, we're working out a way that you can also order them. So don't be shy. If you happen to live in another country, uh, hit us up maybe on Facebook or message us on eBay. We'll figure out how to do it. That's right. Even if you're from another planet, we'll somehow figure it out. 
We will, we will <laughs> Eventually, in the next <laughs> two to 3,000 years, we'll yeah. work out something. We'll still be here. Yes. <laughs> but in addition to the T-shirts, if you join Patreon, yes, Patreon, we have a Patreon account. Mm. Now, the Patreon account will unlock an entire world for you of, <gasps> of goodies. Of monstrous. Yes. Lights. I mean, extra bonus audio and little films and stuff that we did in the past and just all kinds of treasures. But in addition to that, what you will also get is if you order a t-shirt or cap, you will get some extra goodies that will throw in with your box. And uh, these things come from Biff Bang Pow Toys, uh, donated by Jason Lindsay. And who knows, we could throw something else in there. I don't know. But you'll get some extra stuff. It'll be great. And, you know, you'll be the uh, envy of the neighborhood. Yes, you will. So join Patreon. All you got to do is go to patreon.com, go to Monster Party, click the join button, follow the instructions. It's only five dollars a month five dollars five dollars i spend more on gum each month yes i know yes <laughs> spend more on snuff <laughs> now there you go that's the answer i was looking for <laughs> because see sean is he's a fop a lot of people don't realize that yeah but he's been a fop for years and he's constantly going through snuff yeah. Snuff, really? Yeah. Snuff? Yeah, yeah. You didn't know that about him. No, yeah. no, big, I did not. Big snuff guy. I, yeah. He's uh, he's always up to snuff. <laughs> All right, get us out of this, please, James. <laughs> on that note, let's remind our listeners that you can also find us on Facebook and YouTube at Monster Party TV. And as mentioned before, you know, we've got a, a really fun Japan video on YouTube, Monster Party Goes to Japan. Check it out if you haven't already. Uh, also, a lot of other fun YouTube videos like Comic-Con, and Planet of the Apes, Halloween. Check them out. They're buried treasures. You can also find us on Twitter where our handle is at Monster Party HQ and our Instagram handle also Monster Party HQ. And whatever platform you're listening to us on, Find a way to write a review, and we will read it on the air. You betcha. That's right. <laughs> on that note, I am Matt Weinhold. I'm Sean Sheridan. I am Larry Strofe. And I'm James Gonis. Keep America strong. And make Monster Party one of your fright favorites. Then turn down the lights, curl up next to the TV, and put on Meet Me in St. Louis. <laughs> 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 David, just you know, I'm Sean, by the way. I'm the one who uh, initially uh, talked yep, with Seda and uh, Matt. It's Matt. And yeah, I have I, Halloween. <laughs> the Halloween background. Yes, I, I like what, to consider what, what, myself what, the comedy relief. I was what, coming what, what to the you. Hell is, was, what the hell is this, Sean? I was coming it, to you, Larry. Yes, but and, you're all. And, and this oh, is Matt's Larry. Got... This is Larry with the amazing, just simply amazing background, and uh, and James with the. Rather Spartan. Actually. Yeah, James is uh, the <laughs> Michael Cohen home arrest uh, motif. <laughs> yes. Oh, he's got a Halloween cup. He's got a oh, Halloween there you cup. Go. Yes. There you go. And a I have little, my little. collection behind me. So. <clears throat> yeah, we're all we're all big fans. We're big nerds. Yes. I think all of us. I I'll bet you have multiple copies of the Monster Show in our libraries. Yes. Yeah. Oh yes. yes. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and all Hollywood Gothic. The, yeah, I have yeah. a couple different books reading. Oh, yes. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, you have to forgive us if we fanboy every once in a while, you know. Yes. Oh, like he's never had that, you know. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure David, you've been on You'll a show. you have to explain to me what fanboys are. I'm not sure I've ever uh, <laughs> encountered uh, the species. I... <laughs> <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
But uh, yeah, this is going to be great. I mean, like, I, don't, I, I know that all of us have seen like just pretty much every DVD commentary and yeah, every feature uh, thing that your, you've done. So we're, we're giant fans. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Your universal you. monster stuff is yeah. You know, people, people think I'm still doing those. I did the last <laughs> one for Universal over 20 years ago. No. Wow. Right. Really? Wow. And, and I still get fan mail and people are asking what's next. And um, well, go ask Universal. Maybe they'll. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Really? really? Yeah. Totally. But you don't look a day older. <laughs> yes, I do, and that's another reason to do a lot of. Uh, <laughs> All right. All right. Hey, David. On a totally unrelated subject, you you are friends with uh, David Scow, correct? Oh yeah, yeah. And we're confused all the time. Yes, that's a, it's right. hilarious because we ha- we've had him on the show a couple yeah. times, and he's wonderful. And, and, and also, aren't aren't both of your middle names also start with a J? J. Too? They do. So, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty yeah. amazing. And Mine he said, John, I'm not sure what David's is, but right, right. But he, he was really with this. People have conversations about uh, one of us and they uh, realize they're talking about the other one. <laughs> yeah. He told us the exact same thing. It's and he, he, yeah, <laughs> we're evil twins. Right. right. <clears throat> the best kind of evil. That's right. <laughs> evil for good. If there is such a thing. <laughs> right. Tell me about, I don't know about Monster Party. How long have you been doing uh, this? Oh my God. What, where have you been? <laughs> okay. All right. Easy, where, where, easy, where, easy. Where, where been? Okay. okay. Okay, Matt. Go. All right. We are, we've been doing this for, a, uh, it's getting on six years now. No, no, it's over It six is six years. years? Okay. Do, don't you even know about it? Okay. Our all, all right. All right. All right. And uh, we've been doing this thing for over six years. It started off as a, a video thing that we did on YouTube. And uh, we were sitting in James's living room, and it was about 104 degrees, and we we're all just sweating our asses off recording these episodes and setting up lights. And we thought this would be much easier to do as a podcast. And uh, we just really wanted to replicate what we would normally do when we'd go to conventions. We'd go to Comic Con, and we'd end up at the end of the day in one of our hotel rooms. And uh, we'd start drinking some cocktails. And next thing you know, we're arguing over slow zombies and fast zombies and uh, yeah, assorted yeah. nonsense. Yeah. And, and the great thing, David, is we have over 175 episodes. We have been consistently a new episode every other week. And we haven't missed one two week period. So yeah. it's and been we, consistent. And we cover, you know, we cover, I mean, between the four of us, we have a collective knowledge of this stuff because we're all lifelong monster kids. We eat and breathe, you know, horror and sci-fi. And uh, it's been great because we've also, it's been a great reason to kind of get together to do this, but also we've had lots of filmmakers and, and great horror, guests, yeah. horror experts and, you know, all kinds of people. Which Every is, walk of life, yeah. as long as it yeah. was filmmaking, horror, and stand-up comedy. <laughs> but, but the great yeah. thing for you, David, is our reach has been growing steadily, you know, every yeah. year. We've gone as much as like 10,000 downloads per episode. So, you know, when we started, we were so thrilled that, oh my gosh, we got a hundred. And now <laughs> it's like, it's, it's much bigger. So I think the yeah. key just being consistent and we're passionate and we're very enthusiastic. And like Sean said, we, we have had a, a great variety of guests and uh, we, so thrilled to have you on. Yeah, and and this yeah, is and really. this is really loose. This is like you know when we say monster party, we want it to be a party. We want it to be just real loose and conversational and full of laughs and information. Well, it's yes. loose, but we do have a topic. It's you know. Well, no, yes, yeah, we, we do have a topic, team. and and yes. I'm sure you're aware of this. And I can't wait to get started. How long do we usually go with this? Three hours. <laughs> well, let's just say, I'm let's just, just kidding, say, David. I'm just kidding. You know, our average one can be like an hour and a half, but honestly, it can be as long as you want. Doesn't uh, Zoom have a little uh, toggle that you can improve your appearance somehow? <laughs> oh, I wish. <laughs> oh my. Yeah. Blurs, I mean, no, no. I think it, it, it's supposed to. Uh, oh, the filter. Your appearance by. Something oh. like that. Oh, yeah. kind, of like, kind of like the old Star Trek episodes where they put the filter in all the female <laughs> casts, yeah, right. the close-ups. You know, if they could play the romantic music at the same time, then that would oh, be yeah. right. that'd yes. be awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> all right. Well, maybe we should get to this. Yes, and yeah, we're okay. this is Matt. We're calling this Halloween Essentials, right? You came up with this topic, so great. Whatever I, you think it, I, I love it. I think yeah, it's great. I think that yeah. works. Yeah, that's a good opportunity for David um, to talk about his book too. And and David, I'm sure as a kid you dressed up in costumes, right? For Halloween, I did. Um, oh, 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 and I always... it, save it, save it, save it. That's save great. It, okay. <laughs> I want to know. 
I want to know. <laughs> all right. I, I have all of, you know, I've got my things and, you know, the stories. I can't wait to hear yours. Yeah. When Matt's recording. I'm recording now. Okay. <clears throat> Can I just tell you a little sad story of Halloween? Uh-oh. Sure. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, Better be sad. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's incredibly sad. It's so sad. And and I was going to talk about it during the show, and I'm glad I didn't because I didn't want to, you know, have a have a downer part it's of that. Sad. So, wow. Bring down the room. So who did you kill? Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so as we know, at Halloween time, are you Zodiac? No, 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 no. <laughs> when Halloween, just before Halloween, that's when they come out with the Halloween candy. And the Halloween costume. Yes, I'm familiar with Halloween. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and Halloween. And and I'm sure I'm sure you guys have noticed the Halloween Pez dispensers. Oh, yes. Have you looked at the Halloween Pez dispensers. Well, are there, there's always yeah. like new ones each year, right? Kind That's of, right, uh, sir. Right. Yes. Okay. I have yes. not. I have not noticed them. Oh. 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 Really? Well, I guess you're I'm quarantined. Uh, oh, yeah. oh! You're yeah. out, Galavan. You may be spreading out. the virus, walking around breathing on all the yeah. dispensers <laughs> everywhere. Fine. Okay. First of all, I want you to know that I am out with my mask. I put my mask on. <laughs> That's and, hilarious. And I put on the mask. And Listeners, I, he just put on a a mask over his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, well, well, I don't. In case to. his in case his eyes sneeze. <laughs> it's a face covering. Yes. It, no. It's imagine. True. So here's uh-huh. what happened. No, the truth is, my daughter is. You know, she's into cosplay, and she said, "Hey, Daddy, can we go to the spirit store?" So we put on our masks and we keep our distance. So we've gone to the spirit store twice. Mm-hmm. And as we're there, she's looking through the stuff, and of course, I'm looking through things, and I'm all, "Ooh, look at those Pez dispensers!" And then it hit me years ago when I was about eight years old. I managed to get right, right when they came out for Halloween, the creature from the Black Lagoon Pez dispenser. Well, it had an orange wait, stem. You've and told a black... us this story before, Larry. Oh, oh, but this is what I, this is what you don't know. Okay. So you know what happened, Sean? Well, I thought you said you actually broke. You accidentally, you accidentally broke, stepped on it. Stepped I on or stepped on it. The creature Pez. Yes. Right. Here is the little black piece of his head. This is all that I have left. Oh, wow. Wow. But I, I still but have it. Look, hold it up, hold it up closer, and keep it still, so I can see and talk, so I can go big to your screen. Say something. Here it is, right here. This so is what's left. What was the face? The well, that's just it. I crushed the face. Yeah. The oh, that's, that the that's, that's the back. That's the back little guess. ridge of it. So, okay. So got it. this is all. Larry I- is holding a tiny piece of black plastic with a <laughs> a ridge on the back of it, and a, so, and a, and there's a little area. With a hole in it, which is where it would have the, the stuck inside. The turn. Yeah, the right. hinge. Yes. Okay. So, so I still have it, Sean. I right. still have it. That is sad. Yes. Is this you the know? end of the story? <laughs> <laughs> yes, because I, because when I got okay, it, let's it was, move on then. No, it, it, the sad <laughs> thing is, if I find it on eBay, it's like over two hundred dollars. It's like, oh, oh my, the God. black one. Yes, yes. The the one that everyone wants is the green one. Right, that's and that's how much is that one worth? Well, it varies because I've seen it sell for like two fifty, but I've also seen it sell for four hundred dollars. It depends on you know the condition and how many creature fanatics are out there. But right. but here's the thing, Sean. I I still have the little black creature back head part. See his little it's cool, I guess. See, see? <laughs> yeah. But now, if so... only I could find pieces and I could make one like how Matt like. Well, what about if you and... find a green one and paint it black? No, he's not going to do that. Why, why, why would I and, uh, be so idiotic? Wait, 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 wait. And instead, of, instead of walking every, around pathetically later in life holding half of a Pez head? I think I've got it. I think, I, I, I think I've got it. That is, yes, that is terribly sad. It's like, it's like the sad version of uh, Marie Antoinette doll, you know, from Adam's Family. <laughs> yeah, 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 right, totally. But Sorry. you know what you could do is you yeah. can get one of those reissue creature kits Get the face from that. 
Yeah. Yeah, maybe. And I, I, yeah, I know it wouldn't be the actual thing, Larry, but you could probably. Or you could move like on. That. You could just move on. <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> oh no, no, what, Larry, Larry. Are you? Be, are you? Larry, Larry, you realize that? Throw this away, Larry. No, no, I want to. Fi- I want to find out what. No, bar- bury it. Give it a someday. <laughs> no, Larry. Bring it to Hollywood Forever Cemetery. You, you will be buried with that. <laughs> I think that creature, little lonely half a creature head, Pez head. You, it'll be it in is. your coffin next to you. I okay. have things that I've broken over the years that I find and then I go, why am I holding on to this? And I l- throw it away. <gasps> yeah. you, gotta, you gotta take it on that glass bottom boat. Give it burial at sea. <laughs> yeah. No, that's what you could do. You could give it a, a proper burial. Take it to yeah. the, the actual lag- Black Lagoon. That would be like yeah. purging. You could throw it at <laughs> Rico Browning. <laughs> that would be a good way to <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll take spend- that. You'll spend three but don't drop it month. because Rico may step on that one. Yeah, and then well, you're in trouble. It's funny you guys say that. You know, I know you all laughing. You're all ah, let's just toss it. But I, I'm willing to bet if I put this up on eBay, there's some but that's got the thing. Yeah, you're right. Do it. Go yeah. it. Do it. I want to say I want I want you to do that because I want to see what happens. All right. That would be then, a, yeah. Okay. So that's my creature story. And then all the right, last. Cool. That was great. Thing, the last. I, wait, there's another thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a happy thing. This is a happy oh, thing. All right. Oh, okay. I think you like, you remember I mentioned to you years ago how I was Robin Hood for one Halloween? I do remember. Yes. Look, <sighs> look, here's my hat. <laughs> <laughs> I found my hat. Okay, you should take a photo of your. It's a little, uh, isn't it a little, it's a little Matterhorn, isn't it? <laughs> well, when you, when, you, when you look at the picture of me, it's clear that I'm Robin Hood. You know, my, my my mom made this. Don't what? don't what, don't make fun of I'm my not, mom. Hey, this is, I, this I, this is, is look at wow. this. <laughs> look that, at that this. I jumped a couple <laughs> steps very quickly. <laughs> now I'm besmirching wow. your mom. But it's got uh, these daisies on on a strike. I don't remember. Yeah. yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. Like well, I, Ricola. I, yeah, that's what I'm saying. About. Yes, it's Matterhorn. It's like you you're one of the guys that works at the mat. Please watch your step. Were Pull you, the bar uh, all the you, way down. Are you working at Oktoberfest right now, Larry? <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's very funny. Very that's funny. Cool, though. That's cool, Yeah, that, that's great. That's great. Okay. La- last thing. Last thing. Oh, oh, there's a third thing. Because comedy comes in threes. Okay. <laughs> I mentioned Margaret O'Brien in Meet Me in St. Louis. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. You did. Here is my autograph. Of Margaret O'Brien. Oh, uh, well, that's cool. Oh, nice. wow. Isn't that do, you, do you have the Margaret O'Brien Pez dispenser? <laughs> I, I have that. Yeah, <laughs> distinctive dummies, but yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. there was a mo- there was a moment, Sean. I thought you were serious. <laughs> Second. Really? Second. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. so, all, so whenever we're making a joke about some product that doesn't exist, obviously, <laughs> you're the one actually who is being fooled by these things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're the only one, not well, any of your listeners. Here, here's the thing. You guys are very knowledgeable. I mean, Sean. No, or has, not. Uh, yes. Uh, no, no. Not when it comes to fictitious products. Yeah. You guys have. We're making uh, shit up. We have you, very knowledgeable about our own little uh Area worlds, yes, yes. that's right. Yes. So yes. when you said uh, Margaret O'Brien has dispenser for a second, like, oh, was it? <laughs> because yeah, I mean, what Sean's not going to lie to me, but but, yes, but like is. if I say something like, "Hey, you know, make sure you get the human centipede color form set," and you say. They're okay. Come on, there is no color form set. Nobody believes. That wouldn't be a. They wouldn't. Color forms would go out of but, business. But you see, here's the thing. Here's the thing. You're, Nobody when believes you, that. When you when you set when you say that, there are people that listen to you, Matt, and believe. No, they you. don't. Yes, they do. I just want us to be honest with our no, information. No, but see, but, you're, you're no, actually, but, you, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> honest. The whole idea of a joke. So, do you think that <laughs> jokes are just a series of lies? <laughs> They're jokes. <laughs> They're made up thing. <laughs> True. But hey, Larry, you the one who pointed out was it you that put on the Facebook or something about the human centipede gummies? I did. That was great. That's genius. That hey, you know what? Up. You know what, Larry? I I forwarded that to Jake Johansson. Yes. Because uh, we used to get together and we'd watch horror movies. And you'll yeah. you'll appreciate this because I bring over stuff that was weird. And I, hey, you know, we watched The Descent and some other yes. things. And I brought over the human centipede. Yes. I broke him. 
I broke really? up. Like, oh yeah. By the end of that, he just looked at me. He's like, I don't. I should not have watched that. Oh, uh, <laughs> I, lo- I love Jake Johansson. See, I, I, I thought you'd like that. No, I, 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 I but I, I like forwarded it. that to him because I oh, thought it'd be it's, funny. That's awesome. That's awesome. <clears throat> that's awesome. Good times. Yeah. On that note, have yourself, have your own, have yourself, have yourself so your own Halloween. essential Halloween. Like, like the name of our episode. <laughs> and watch Meet Me in St. Louis. Yes. <laughs> but the one that's titled where meat is spelled M E A T. <laughs> and it's Meet Me in St. Louis, by the way. Uh, you know, <laughs> I feel I feel so stupid you know, because I had the no, song in my head. Yeah, meet me in St. Louis, Louis. Meet me at the. Fa- I know we can't use this, but isn't it the like, Hey Screwy? See you in St. Louis. Yeah, that's right. Is that Bugs yeah. Bunny or something? Or yeah, well, yeah. It was. There was also a song in the Yogi Bear movie. Is that right? Go go St. Louis. Go. Sven Gulli uh, samples it. Well, oh I'm, yeah, I think you're right. The, the one I'm talking about is the most most famous one. You know that Judy Garland sings, right? Yes, I've heard of Judy Garland. Yeah, yes, I think I know her. Um, so, what should we? Uh, so, uh, have how, about, your... how about something like? How about something like? Make every day of the year Halloween. Something like that. Watch an your essential own essential Halloween or an essential. Watch your own fright favorites. That's good. Something, something like that. Yeah. Um, Thirty-one movies to haunt your Halloween and beyond. Fright favorites. Number 1,000, meet me in St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I how, will... St- how, how, and make Monster Party one of, one of your fright favorites. There you something go. Like that. Oh, that's something nice. Like that. that's, that's nice. nice. I like that something, it. something like that. that. Nice. That's, we, uh, don't, we don't have to have everything, every one of these to be all, you know, kooky. That's a nice one, Sean. Well, we can have yes. something before that, but maybe, yeah, it's like... We can also just say, you know... Happy Halloween, everybody, and have your, and make Monster Party. Are we going to do another Halloween one after this? No. I don't, I, not necessarily. I don't, we can know, just do – I mean, look, every episode of ours is like a Halloween episode, so I don't yeah. mind if we don't. I don't think – especially – no, I don't think we should now that we're doing this one. You lazy bastards. <laughs> Unless it's really Although, different, no, though. We can't talk about how dare the, the you. Topic, the topic of, <laughs> of TV, TV specials and episodes that are Halloween-themed is a great one. I think we should remember that for next year. Yes. Yeah. No, you're right. That could, I, just, I mean, just, just yeah. as a reminder, you know, there's this Rich Carell thing that we're supposed right. to that do. That could be so relatively maybe, Halloween-y if we yeah. end up doing that, you know. Yeah. 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 But we can say happy early, you know, just an early... I don't think we need to say it. I th- I don't say happy Halloween. Just let's go about how how you said ha- make Monster Party your uh, what's it your fr- your own one fr- of your fr- fr- favorite favorites. Yeah, the, there you go. cool as you're you're plugging his book again. So okay, so what if we did? Yeah. Make Halloween. What, what was what did you say again, Sean? Um, well, something, and then say and make Monster Party your own fright favorite. One of your and one make of your Monster own- Party. Keep one America strong. Right make favorite. make Monster Party one of your fright favorites. Yeah, that's the name of his book, right? Yeah, favorites. so you don't think we have to say anything reg- Halloween ish at all then at the end? Mm-mm. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. And then turn down the lights, curl up next to the TV, and watch Meet Me in St. Louis. <laughs> 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 that's funny let's do it 